Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees this afternoon to this webinar on the role of natural gas as a transitionary fuel for Southern Africa. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Ramsgate in KwaZulu-Natal, KwaZulu about 150 kilometers south of Durban. A big welcome also to our presenters this afternoon, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation. In December 2021, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy released the Gas Master Plan Base Case Report for public comment and input. Its intention was to establish baseline information to develop a gas master plan roadmap for the natural gas sector in South Africa, which has been described by Minister Gwedi Mantasha as a game changer for South Africa. Once developed, the gas master plan is intended to serve as a policy instrument and roadmap for strategic, political and institutional decisions, which will guide the industry investment, planning and coordinate implementation. Further work in this area has been done in respect on the role of gas in South Africa's path to net zero by the National Business Initiative and Boston Consulting Group. The report was released in February 2022 and it assesses pathways for South Africa to decarbonize by 2050 and the potential role of gas in South Africa's transition. Work is also underway by African international advisors in association with the South African Development Community, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and the IDC of South Africa for the, for the development of a regional gas master plan to coordinate and integrate the planning of regional gas supply initiatives amongst African and South African development community member countries. South Africa and the region also need to be cognizant of international gas developments and issues arising in respect of climate change, methane leakage, and gas market price and supply upheavals in Europe, resulting from Putin's war in Ukraine. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence uh, and supported by Agora Energy Vendor and the International Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis and is sponsored and supported by Boston Consulting Group, African International Advisors, Meridian Economics, and Mac Consulting. The webinar is the first in 2022, covering the role of natural gas as a transitionary fuel for Southern Africa, along the pathways to the country's commitment to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But the webinar is not expected to be the last on natural gas and hydrogen, which is also a gas, as further work is done in these fields. I'm hoping that the next gas webinar will dig deeper into the work on the regional gas master plan being prepared by Africa International Advisors with the DBSA and the, Development Bank, uh, and the Industrial Development Corporation and the Southern African Development Community. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward uh, to the finalization of this work and we hope to be able to dig deeper into this uh, in due course. We should also not forget the South African National Gas Master Plan um, as it gets underway. May I say up front that I personally have no time for nuclear, coal, gas, renewable energy or other technology lobbyists. Today we are presenting hard information on both sides of this contested space in efforts to clarify the way forward for solutions towards ensuring security of supply in a just energy transition in Southern Africa that can be delivered quickly, at least cost, and with maximum socioeconomic benefit. Over a thousand delegates have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject, 
This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered and to the stature of the presenters. May I express a big thanks to all the presenters and panelists for their participation and for the time and effort they have put in. I'm also truly grateful for the support of Agora Energy Vendor, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, Boston Consulting Group, Africa International Advisors, Meridian Economics, and Max Consulting for the work these organizations do in support of a just energy transition in Southern Africa, in Africa, and indeed globally. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download all presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. We have set aside about half an hour after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. So may I now take this opportunity to introduce uh, Dave Collins, who will set the scene for today's presentations Dave consults on associations, NGOs, and top 100 companies listed on the Johannesburg Securities Exchange. Uh, his particular interests are in the fields of carbon policy, disruptive technologies, scenario planning, and how the world may look in 2050. He received a master's degree in chemical engineering from Cambridge University a long time ago, he says, and has more than 50 years experience in industry in Zambia, Australia, United Kingdom, Germany, Netherlands, and South Africa. So without further ado, may I now hand over to you, Dave. We can see your presentation. Uh, please proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Am I on full screen? All good, thank you. Good, thank you. Thanks, Chris. And I think we must thank you, Chris, for the effort you put into putting all these things together because there's some very important issues we all need to discuss. So what we're going to talk about is the role of gas, but Chris has asked me to put some focus on the role of gas, particularly in balancing renewable electricity. So we will talk about that. I will talk about that in a bit more depth as part of my presentation, but just in terms of who's speaking today, Chris has mentioned Anna Maria Yeller Makarovic, uh, global perspective. Henry will talk about the Sub-Saharan Africa perspective, Kesh, on the work that uh, BCG has done with NBI and Boza, Adam from Meridian. And then I'm going to give an overview of the, all the perspectives that I've been able to find on the views on decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2050, with a real focus on the role of gas in balancing, which um, as Chris suggests, many consider to be key to today's discussion. So having established the logical order of events from the top to the bottom, I'm now going to turn it totally upside down. And I will just carry on now with my bit about the views on decarbonizing the sector, the, gas, the electricity sector. And as we know, there's probably four big potential uses of gas balancing renewable electricity, phasing out coal and synth fuels, phasing out coal in industry, and maybe a smaller one, but nevertheless a possibility is um, transport heavy commercial vehicles until other technologies like fuel cells, whatever, are available. When I say gas, by the way, for those who um, like to be precise, we're talking about natural gas, which some of us like to, some people like to refer to as fossil gas, but we're talking about natural gas, fossil gas. So that's going to be the focus now of what I'm going to say for the next few minutes. I had occasion earlier this year to look at all the sources I could find on the views on decarbonizing the sector by 2050. And I didn't take I didn't look at, um, like Chris was talking about lobbying, I, I didn't look at, say, a paper that was purely focused on engines for gas or small nuclear reactors. I rather looked at um, studies that looked at the whole 
sector and the whole mix of technologies that would be required to decarbonize the sector. Uh, in no particular order, there was work done by Meridian um, almost two years ago. You all, I'm sure, are aware of that. The work that uh, Kesh will be talking about, um, done by BCG with uh, 4NBI and Boza. Um, McKinsey have published a short discussion document, which I was able to discuss with them. Obviously, the ERC have done a lot of work. Uh, ERC now um, rebranded as the Energy Systems Research Group. And then I got a lot of very helpful comments and insights from people like Emily, James, Chris himself, Bryce, Mike, Tobias, Cannon, Clyde, Brian, and um, comments reported from Eskom in the press. So I've really tried to look at everything that's available and then see where we agree and where we don't agree. So on the agreement between all these sources, there is a, a, a remarkable agreement, even at a numerical level in terms of capacity, that we should be building a stack of renewable um, solar and wind, and that we should be not building any new nuclear or hydro, nor coal, coal because of costs and emissions, and nuclear and hydro essentially because of costs. Also an agreement certainly qualitatively that there's lots of storage required, which is mostly batteries, but again, I'm saying qualitatively this is agreed, the numbers are not agreed. And the forecasts of total battery require, uh, batteries required vary by a factor of two up to 2050. And remember here, we are talking about decarbonizing the whole sector by 2050. And I guess the reason for these different forecasts on batteries, for example, will be because of different assumptions on the rate of battery technology, the rate of green hydrogen technology. So there's a lot of technical assumptions that do cause these disagreements. But I think we have to just be careful about carbon pricing. Um, carbon pricing is going to play a role. And as you well know, the current effective rate is about two or three dollars a ton after allowances. All the studies used either a zero carbon price or a very low one. And really since then, um, since I did the review in, in, in January more or less, Treasury, as you know, have said that we can expect at least $30 by 2030 with no allowances and up to $120 beyond 2050. And some work I did last year that many of you, have to, I've told many of you about that if you look at the published scenarios for developing countries, including South Africa, they're averaging $56 in 2030 and $188 in 2050. So these are very, very big numbers which are going to impact on the decisions that we need to make on the technologies. So then now, where do we not agree? Sorry, I'll come to this, I'll come to that in a moment. Just one point. One further point before we come to the disagreement, a point of uncertainty, and I'm not going to dwell on this because it's, it's quite futuristic. Um, how do we do the last mile decarbonization? How do we get rid of the final aspects? Is it gonna be direct air capture, CCUS, green hydrogen, small nuclear reactors? That's something that lies ahead of us. And I think everyone agrees that that is very uncertain. So let's not dwell on that. But on the points of divergence between the sources, there's one. And that is on managing the variability in renewable energy generation. And what, what, why do we need to manage this variability? Well, we've got the shorter periods in minutes and hours, batteries can help do that. We've got the longer periods measured in more than six hours or two days with extreme weather events, we can use pump storage. But there's broad agreement that beyond that, these, these, these are still inadequate and they need to be supplemented. And there's quite a, and this is now really the, um, this is now the core of what I'd just like to share with you. This is the range of the viewpoints on solutions. One is that let's use natural gas, which and I don't know what that number is. Is it three years away for offshore sources in combination with batteries possibly coming in later? 
continue to use existing diesel for at least 10 years and then regroup and reconsider. Again, with batteries coming on as soon as possible. And again, with the proviso that there's not an agreement on when batteries will be available. Another one is to overbuild renewable energy capacity, make sure that there's always a sufficient excess. And as many of you know, you can then use that excess to do other things like um, make green hydrogen or store in car batteries, but that's getting a bit futuristic. So there is a, quite a considerable range here of options. And then another one is just to use a wide range of technologies, and maybe that's where we will end up. Today, we've got pump storage and batteries and diesel and gas, but there's a lot of things that we could consider in the future. And I must thank Chris who put that list together. That's a very, I think a very good, very comprehensive list of all the possible options that will develop at various speeds um, over the next couple of years or the next decade. Then there are, there's the comment just we should be aware of that some sources are noting that if we do go to natural gas to, to manage this transition, it could be repurposed to use green hydrogen in the future. Again, another level of complexity that we need to be concerned about. So the concerns and the uncertainties. There's broad agreement, a lot of it is explicit, but some of it is implicit, that if we use gas, it should be a temporary measure. And when you look at the numbers of, um, if you do this now in terms of energy rather than capacity, in terms of energy, in other words, terawatt hours or exajoules, whatever you want to use, we're looking at very low utilization rates of gas if it is used. And generally, most often less than 5%. But let's just put all our cards on the table. We do know that some stakeholders have, uh, stakeholders have a concern about commitments to gas infrastructure and lock-in. The possibility of assets becoming stranded as we strive towards our emission goals to be neutral by 2050. And another interesting comment that's been made is that, well, maybe we should, we should actually use our financial resources to build solar and wind, for, for which is a very clear case, and not for gas, which is many uncertainties, which will come out in the next couple of talks. So I guess only as options become viable, and by that I mean viable from a point of view of technology and practical availability. There's not much point in talking about hydro if, there's not, if it's not practically available. And some of the points that maybe will come out in the next year or more, that there maybe is a cost case for natural gas. Remember, I said I'm not taking any sides here, I'm not saying who said what, but we do know, as we all know, that some people think there could be a cost case for natural gas compared to diesel, whenever it's available. And again, we, I don't know what that number is. Is it two years? Is it three years? Is it five years? There could be a cost case for green hydrogen, but only when it's available. And is that 10 years time? Is it 15 years time or is it sooner? Interesting, we were talking recently to the iron and steel sector, both globally and locally, and we used a year and a half ago, only a year and a half ago, we were saying green hydrogen might hit South Africa 2040 and Europe in the late 30s. Now we're saying that thing has come forward 10 to 15 years in a year and a half to two years. So things are moving very quickly there. Digital demand side management, obviously, dynamic pricing. And then all the benefits of the integration of sectors and increasing penetration of electric vehicles. So there's a lot um, can happen into the future. And then to finalize, my, my, my takeaway is that there is disagreement between expert sources on the role of gas in balancing renewables. And presumably this arises from, at least it arises from, differences in assumptions on technology development and costs, and possibly there's some other reasons that will come out in the discussions. Thank you everyone for your attention, uh, and back to you, Chris.
Thank you very much, Dave, uh, for those opening words and setting the scene for us today. It's really greatly appreciated. And um, Dave, if you could stop sharing, I see you've done that already. Thank you, Dave, uh, for that. And it's really now a great pleasure for me to introduce our first uh, opening speaker. Uh, and that is uh, Anna Maria Jala Makarovitz. Uh, Anna Maria is an energy analyst for the uh, Institute of Energy, Economics and Financial Analysis, which is an international and uh, she is in the Europe team, her and LNG, as well as other work. Uh, Anna Maria is an international energy in power and natural gas markets and industry. She has designed and led energy training programs in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and Europe. Anna Maria received her BSc honors in electrical engineering and her master's degree at the University de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. I hope I've got my pronunciation right. <laughs> So it's a great pleasure for us to meet you, uh, uh, Anna Marie. I believe you are dialing in all the way from the south of France, where I hope to be in the next month or two visiting my daughter who lives in France. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, welcome. And we are looking forward to uh, seeing your presentation, which we can see on the screen now. If you could kindly put it into full screen mode, that's perfect. And it looks, it looks perfect now. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Very grateful for this invitation. Um, and I hope I can show you in these uh, moments more or less uh, our experience on the research we have done on Europe, dependency on Russian gas, and how uh, Europe is transiting away from, from it. Um, as, as I said, um, I work for the AIFA uh, as Energy Analyst Europe. And please feel free to ask any questions if needed. So analyzing uh, Europe's dependency on Russian gas, we can analyze that Russia's exports, let's say in 2020, were mainly gone to Europe. Yeah, so we can see a big uh, import there based on Russian gas. And uh, the majority have been Germany, Italy, France, Turkey, Netherlands, Austria, Poland, UK, and Hungary. And when we analyze, for example, the, the demand in the EU plus UK, we have noticed from the, if we can see the production, the indigenous production in green, the moment the, the production started lowering, then in red, we can see an increase in Russian imports. Here uh, in 2019, we have a little bit of LNG coming in. The same, we, there's also imports from other LNG, from non-Russian, from North Africa, from Norway. So we, we have a little, uh, uh, um, um, a very mixed matrix, but uh, uh, I wanted to show is how dependent the uh, Europe has become on Russian gas. And what happened, um, in, in Europe lately, and this is something really important to show what has been Europe doing with the gas pipelines coming from Russia to Europe. 30, 40 years ago, all those pipelines that were coming, bringing gas from Russia to Europe were transiting via Ukraine. So we have a set of pipelines called the Brotherhood Pipeline that they, they were transiting more than 100, 120 BCM, that was the capacity. And they were bringing um, Russian gas through uh, Slovakia, uh, Ukraine, Slovakia, up to Western Europe. Then the, the Transbalkan pipeline was bringing Russian gas up to Romania and Bulgaria via Moldova. Then the, there was a lot of problems happening with Russia and Ukraine. And then Europe decided, to diversify, this is very important. 
energy, diversity, they diversify the roots, but they didn't diversify the source. So they were concerned on energy security, on diversification of, of sources, but at the end they were bringing the same gas, but via different pipeline. And uh, we can see that from 20, 2003, uh, pipelines started to come into operation. We have Blue Stream that was cross, it crosses the Black Sea and brings gas uh, directly to Turkey. Yamal, that is Belarus, uh, Poland, up to uh, Germany. Nord Stream, that is through the uh, Baltic Sea up to Germany. And the Turk Stream, also another pipeline via the Black Sea up to Turkey. And without taking into consideration also the Nord Stream 2 that was supposed to start operation today, uh, this year. And that one is parallel to Nord Stream 1. And what we can see on the right here is a big drop on transit flows through Ukraine, actually like 100 BCM in 20 years. So that, that has been showing that slowly, slowly, there was less gas uh, passing via Ukraine and more gas through the other areas. Yeah, But, but was more gas coming through the other, other pipelines. And then suddenly, on the 24th of February, as we know, sadly, Russia invaded Ukraine. We can see the flows in this map of via Yamal, via Ukraine, Nord Stream, Third Stream to Bulgaria. These were all the Russian gas coming up to Europe. We can see the Nord Stream, the, the one in green, that goes directly to Germany, that had a, a big transit to, of Russian gas up to Germany, directly to Germany. Then uh, um, this was when the invasion happened. And even though the invasion happened, we didn't see any reduction in flows. Actually, there was an increase on 28% on Russian imports between February to March. There was also some increase in the UK to EU from Libya, from Azerbaijan, LNG as a general, Norway, Algeria. Then we notice. The other big event that happened was on the 27th of April that uh, Russia cut uh, Poland and Bulgaria from its gas. So we see a stop here on the Yamal LNG flows. So this is more or less technically what, what is happening uh, in the flows here um, in Europe. And then when we see this, this situation, it's amazing to see what's happening. Not only Russian gas is coming to Europe via pipeline, but it also comes via LNG. And that's another concept that was uh, wrongly said because the LNG terminals were built to diversify sources, to bring uh, gas into Europe from different parts of the world. And actually they, they are still bringing Russian gas. Uh, in April 20, 2002, we saw a big percentage of Russian gas into the imports in Belgium. 44% uh, came from Russia. 18% uh, in France came from Russia. Netherlands, 24%. And Spain, 11%. So that is uh, something that is interesting to, to see that uh, the diversification of sources hasn't really worked that well. And then another important thing to understand is uh, capacity. We saw a big increase on the LNG imports in Europe. You know, so now with this fear that they was going to be, they were going to stop the pipe gas from Russia. Then lots of uh, countries started importing more LNG. But at the same time that we could see the imports here in green, we understand that the utilization rate of some of those uh, LNG terminals is still low. So there's still spare capacity there to be able to bring more gas, but it's also to show that there, are been, there have been some LNG terminals that have been built in Europe without, the, in accord, without taking into accordance the demand, the actual demand in Europe. For example, one big case of that is Spain that they, they have the greatest numbers of LNG terminals in Europe. The, and even in normal conditions, not even less than 40 or around 40 or less than that percent of, is being utilized. 
So at least 50% of the LNG terminals in Spain have not been into full operation and that's for more than 10 years, 15 years. It's not something recent. And there's even an LNG terminal called El Musel that is mouthful. So even though when it started, was supposed to start, it didn't start, it's never started. That was like around 2013. So we have some uh, LNG terminals that has been there standing without being even in operation, never ever. Uh, and then even with this big increase of LNG imports in Spain, we still see that is 56%. So that, that is showing you how much spare and unused capacity is there in certain countries in Europe. If you under, to understand properly like what has happened in Europe, it's, it's good to try to understand demand with investment, we have to link them. And I think one of the issues that we have been noticing in, in Europe is the lack of union between these. It's like you build what is needed and you build for the demand that is forecast to happen. And they have been building sometimes not, not based on the technicality of the gas demand. We see from 2010, if you can see, this is uh, from EIA that uh, EU plus the UK natural gas demand has been even decreasing. Yeah. So the, for the last 10 years, it hasn't been growing. The demand hasn't been growing and we are justifying more investment and more investment that maybe is not needed there. Uh, if we compare 2019 to 2020, electric power reduced. Commercial has more or less stayed similar, a little bit of, of reduction in, in residential, and industry has more or less kept flat. So where we have seen a bit of reduction has been in electrical power, but we haven't seen any increase in demand in any of the other sectors. And the demand is even expected to fall even further. Uh, there were some uh, forecasts in dif with different scenarios created by ENSO where they forecasted uh, the future demand by 2040, 2050, and all of them, they see a reduction in the demand. In some of them, uh, and it's a very interesting to see that the, the global ambition is the power generation to be reduced, the yellow one, uh, actually more than 50% really, um, in certain scenarios. Some of them you see a slower uh, decrease. Um, residential, there's a lot of push also in, uh, in some of, of the countries in, in Europe to be able to reduce the demand of gas in the residential part as well as the, as the other ones. But those are uh, very important areas to cover. We have also in industry, there's also a tendency to, to increase the demand. So all of them, you know, that's the, the future forecast. This is without even taking into consideration what happened two, three months ago. Yeah, this is just a forecast that was done before this invasion and it still uh, was still already showing a decrease in demand. Uh, and it's important to notice what has been uh, uh, affecting this demand. And we have seen an increase in renewable energy sources that actually it made up to 37% of gross electricity consumption in the EU. And it came up from, uh, in, that's what it was in 2020, while in 2019 it was 34%. And uh, we have seen uh, some countries leading that, as we can see Austria, Sweden, Denmark, Portugal, Croatia, Latvia, Germany. And then on the ex other extreme, we have Malta. And there are other countries like uh, Norway and Iceland that is there are 100% renewable sources. So we have been, um, the generation has, has been going really high in a lot of countries. That's more or less the tendency uh, that has been happening for the last years in, in Europe to, to see how could we increase more renewable sources. And as I said, this is also before even taking into consideration this year. You know, this was something that was already happening in Europe. Uh, one, one of the issues that we are seeing now, and it's not only now that 
the uh, gas industry is becoming more and more volatile. And as an example, we wanted to show you some price uh, peaks that we have had between the Asian and the Euro uh, prices. And this year, uh, since last year, we started noticing and, and predominantly this year, a big change on prices, you know? So this has created um, a fight for cargos, a, a fight for uh, cargos trying to see where LNG cargos trying to go to where the market that could pay them more. And we are noticing that uh, some of the cargos that are preferring to come to Europe are leaving behind some demand in Asia that was expecting to receive that LNG. So we are seeing a little bit of not a balancing uh, scenario for the demand side, where um, there is uh, some, there would, they, this could create even more energy poverty or energy scarcity in some areas of the world because the high prices of um, gas in Europe has, has shown that, that most of the LNG cargos want to come to Europe, you know, because it's, uh, are able to pay more for that gas. So this is a, this is a very risky uh, market that uh, we wanted to highlight that, that gas that is becoming more a uh, global commodity that is affected by lots of things, risks in the, in the industry. And those risks could be geopolitical issues, economical issues that affect prices, uh, demand, supply issues. Uh, all those things are affecting the price. And that is what is also affecting the consumer bills uh, in Europe. And we have seen a huge increase, actually in the UK it was huge lately, a huge increase increase on the gas prices for the end consumer. So this is affecting all the value chain up to the up to the one that uses gas at home. Yeah. So this is something that that we are concerned about. We are trying to to highlight uh, the risk of this price volatility in the whole value chain of the gas market. Uh, then, with all the things in in place. When the situation happened this year, uh, Europe decided, okay, let's try to be stronger. Let's try to get together uh, a plan that is called Repower EU in response to this global energy market disruption caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Then the plan mainly wants to save energy. So what is the best way that we can uh, re uh, reduce our reliance on Russian gas, reducing demand. If we reduce gas demand, we'll go aligned with dependency on Russian gas, with uh, energy transition, with price. We'll be, uh, we are we're balancing lots of, of different uh, goals that we want to achieve. So the main objective is how can we reduce gas demand because as, as uh, I, I showed you at the beginning uh, the way that Europe was depending more and more not only on Russian gas but on gas itself yeah it was importing more and more and the worrying situation now is if they're going to change from Russia to another source and depend on also on other sources of gas that could also bring a problem later on so if the more we could reduce gas, the more independent we could become as a continent. And one of the things is energy efficiency. If we try to be more efficient, we can save energy in different ways. That will way also we accelerate, you know, clean energy transition. We want to produce more clean energy. And we want to diversify all those energy supplies. So all these will help to phase out dependency on Russian fossil fuels. And I would say, actually, will the main this accelerate clean energy transition and save energy, those two will phase out dependency on gas itself, you know? All that is uh, in accordance with a, a smart investment because uh, we need to really understand where is the need to invest. And if it's the need to invest in some LNG terminals, 
just need it for short term or in a short term solution on the gas system, what is those smart investments we need to do just the minimum required to be able to supply the gas needed in the moment and while the transition is happening. The repower euro will reduce faster the dependency on fossil fuels because the idea will be to increase uh, wind capacity to accelerate uh, rooftop solar PV systems, to innovate more hydrogen-based solutions, and to enable faster permit renewal energy projects. We want the projects to come into operation uh, quicker. Uh, energy savings will cut demand 13% by 2030, so, uh, instead of uh, 9%. And what is the target for renewable energy? We would like to increase by 2030 from 40 to 45 percent. So that means that from we'll, uh, we're expecting to have a capacity of 1,236 gigawatt by 2030, instead of 1,067 that was expected under the Feed for 55 program. That the Feed for 55 was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55 percent. So this was even before the invasion of Ukraine, was already thinking how to reduce green gas emissions. So what we are noticing is that this now, with this repower, we are uh, putting the target even higher on renewable energy. There's a big, uh, very strong solar energy strategy, and it's mainly to install 320 gigawatt of solar photovoltaic by 2025, and around 6,000 by 2030. Doing this will displace consumption around 9 BCM by 2027. So this will help definitely reduce the gas demand. And finally here, just as a general information, what are the benefits of renewable energy? Let's say I'm, I'm talking about uh, the Europe context, but we can we also analyze it in, in the other uh, areas. In Europe, would be the cheapest and cleanest energy available. And the, that's the most important thing. Could be generated domestically. So we will need, we will uh, reduce the risk of importing energy. Yeah, we will going to generate it domestically. And, and for the actual situation in Europe, this is something really important. And I'm sure this applies not only to Europe, this applies to lots of countries around the world. And, and it's interesting to see this graphic because in the last 20 years, we have seen a great, great increase on the cost of power generation by solar and wind, actually around 82% in solar PV, 47 in concentrated solar power, 39% in onshore wind, and 29% in offshore wind. And we can see on this slowly how that has happened and, and, and the biggest increase on, on some of them than others. Um, so this, if we implement this uh, more strongly in Europe, and I'm, I'm sure if, uh, in other places too, we could uh, achieve what we are trying to focus on, and is uh, to keep a balance between uh, diversify energy sources, because I think we cannot think just diversify gas, we need to diversify the sources of energy into the continent, um, reduce price, we need to bring the prices down and go in alignment with the energy transition goals. So I think this would, could be a win-win situation for all of us. So that's it for me. I, I appreciate your time and thank you very much again for this invitation. Great. Um, Are you going to give us your CV, Henry? Your brief yeah. CV. <laughs> so I'll give you my CV. I, I, went, I, went, I promise I won't lie. Um, so I'm Henry Gilfillan. I uh, work for a consultancy called Africa International Advisors. Um, and as I think Chris said in the beginning, um, we are currently in the process. We, we, we did the first phase of the um, SADC Regional Gas Master Plan, um, which was finished um, early last year. Um, and we've, uh, we've just in the process of, of doing work on uh, the second phase of, of, that, uh, of that gas master plan. Um, and and it's obviously is a is a gas master plan, but but obviously we, we have to consider the much broader energy landscape uh, 
in, in the region to do that. And I think if I can um, just, you know, really congratulate Chris um, that, that we're talking about this in a regional perspective and, and framing it as a Southern Africa rather than a South African uh, transition. Because um, I think when you start looking at, at energy from a regional perspective in Southern Africa, I think they, things start looking very different to what we tend to see when we just look at, at, at South Africa. And the reality, you know, energy molecules and electrons don't necessarily recognize political borders. And I think there's two things that, that stand out for us when you look at it from a regional perspective. And, and these are things that um, cut across any, any energy um, discussion or any energy source. The first is, I think when you think about what the energy transition is and, and, and you try and conceive of a problem statement for that, if you look at it from a regional perspective, the problem looks rather different than if you just look at it from a South African perspective. Um, if you look at, at the energy transition from a South African perspective, it's largely a, a story about how do we remove coal and, and, and oil from the transport and, and the electricity sector. Um, and you know, if we get that right, um, we won't necessarily be all the way there, but, but we'll sort of largely be, be, be there. But if you look at it from a regional perspective, there is a, a really nasty big red wedge on, 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 the, on, the, on the chart, the pie chart on the left, which is, which is that the region consumes a huge amount of biomass as a source of energy. And that's not because we've got some biofuels plant somewhere that, that nobody's ever heard of. It's, it's, it's really a function of energy poverty. Um, and and you know, in South Africa, we've got electrification rates in the 90%, but large, most countries in the region actually have electricity penetration in you know, below, below 20%. Um, and so I think we, we view it quite critical, well, that we think it's really critical that um, when we talk about the energy transition, if we're not dealing with energy poverty within this region, um, then we're probably not, we're not succeeding. And so it becomes really critical um, that we are careful not to, in our desire to decarbonize, that we restrict access to, to energy, make it, make it more expensive than it needs to be. And therefore, you know, you need to have perhaps a lot more caution in terms of the energy choices you, you may make um, and the cost implications thereof, then maybe you would be in, in, in other jurisdictions. And also just restricting access um, and, and walking away from potentially viable and, and, and cost-effective energy resources. The second thing that looks very different um, when you look at it from a regional perspective is, you know, when you look at it from a South African perspective, we, we, we don't have many much in the way of domestic gas resources. We actually don't have much in the way of domestic hydro resources as well. Um, but from a regional perspective, um, the region is actually awash, awash with, with with, with huge amounts of, of, of domestic natural gas. Um, so there's actually um, no need to just have a discussion about whether LNG is going to, to be, how expensive imported LNG would be, because we actually do have access to, to domestic gas resources that uh, we will never be able to use uh, completely as a region. And so it's not just the problem that looks very different, but potential solutions actually look, uh, look quite different. So if we then continue along this vein of, 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 of looking at it from a regional rather than a national perspective, um, and, and actually start discussing, well, okay, so what, what role could this regional um, uh, indigenous gas play within the energy transition? I think the first point that we wish to make is we need to think firstly about how do we move the electrons rather than moving gas molecules. Um, and, and I think that's something that is really critical to, 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 to highlight in, in any discussion about, about natural gas as, a, as, a, as an energy source. And that is that the moment you try and transport it, it very quickly becomes a, you know, a lot more expensive. Um, and, and that makes it very different from, from, from the oil market, for instance, where um, the cost of imported LNG, the, the, the easily 40 to 50% of that cost um, is made up from the liquefaction, the shipping, and the resgasification. Um, so if you can find a way to avoid those costs, you actually have an opportunity to get 
um, a lot more of an advantaged uh, price for that, for, for that gas. And the one thing that we do have in Southern Africa that, that, that we're fortunate to have is a relatively, and I say relatively, it's obviously, you know, uh, cognizant of, 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 of the development status of much of Southern Africa, but, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively well-developed regional power grid um, in, the, in the Southern African power grid. And particularly in sort of the eastern, sort of eastern half of the, um, of, of the, of the region, it's, 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 it's reasonably well developed. So we actually have an existing infrastructure that can be leveraged to, to move electrons rather than, than, than being fixated on, on moving molecules. Um, so so that, that's an important, I think, um, point that, that, that we want to make. But let's, let's sort of move away from, from, from a general discussion and into the specific opportunities that we do have um, for, for gas to play a role. And let's just look at, at, at whether that, these are feasible and, and whether and what sort of role they, they could play. So I think I'd like to start with, with Northern Mozambique and the Ruvuma Basin. And, and for those that, that maybe aren't aware, it's, it's, it's well within the top 10 global gas, um, gas resources. With around about 200 TCF in total, if you include Tanzania as well, of, of, of recoverable gas resources. Um, <clears throat> that, that is, is currently being developed. And as we speak, there's, there's one LNG facility that's being commissioned and there's another two onshore LNG facilities that would, would comprise about 28 million tons of, of LNG that, that has either been approved or, or in the process of being approved. So gas, that gas will be produced. Um, it, it won't, it, the, the, the current facilities that are being built won't be nearly enough to, to use up all of that gas. And, and I think one of the important considerations to have is given you know, what we've just heard about, about Europe's plans to, 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 to move away more, perhaps more rapidly from gas is um, a big chunk of that, those gas resources may actually be stranded and may, and may, um, and may never be exported, which, which also does significantly change the sort of considerations of, of, of at what price one could get that. But if we just look at the gas that, that will be pr produced as part of the license conditions and as part of the agreements between the concessionaires and the Mozambique government, a pretty sizable proportion of, of, of gas has been set aside for the, for the domestic market. Um, but, but in order to access that domestic gas for, for domestic use, the region has to come up with, with, with viable, credible projects. Otherwise, that gas would just be exported to um, to LNG, as LNG as well, and, 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 and the Mozambique government would be compensated in, in some way. So, and, and, and when I say sizable amount of gas, it's sufficient to support sort of mid-merit uh, gas generation of six, anywhere between six to, to 20, 20 gigawatts, depending on, on various sort of um, considerations in terms of, of the commitments made. So just on that basis, in terms of the commitments that are being made to have linked to existing LNG projects or pro LNG projects about to be commissioned. There is more than enough gas to, to support quite a substantial amount of gas to power in the region. So as part of the work that, that we've, we've been doing in, in the last months, we looked at, at, at what the grid could, could do and, and what, what opportunities and what possibilities do we have for, for gas to power generation in, in Northern Mozambique. And, and I'll get to the economics of that a little bit later. And what we, from that, from that modeling, we, we sort of came to a, an outcome which said that spending about 100 to $150 million on grid infrastructure in Northern Mozambique around, around the port of Nakala could unlock potential um, gigawatt of, 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 of mid-merit gas to power which is not too far off what um, the IRP, 2019 IRP, um, considered as what would be required to support an unconstrained renewables um, uh, uh, build by, by 2030. Now, obviously, you know, the world has moved on a little bit since 2019, but, but roughly a gigawatt of gas to power can, can unlock a, a fairly substantial possibility for for, 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 for um, more, more accelerated uh, uh, renewables rolling. 
But there's, a, there's another interesting synergy between renewables and, and, and gas to power in Northern Mozambique, which, which if you just look at the longitudinal lines on this map, um, by having solar power particularly in Northern Mozambique, you're adding easily an hour of daylight to, to the South African day. Um, which, which, and, and that daylight comes in, in the morning, right? Which is, which is often quite difficult to, to match if you, if you, if you try to store solar. So there's strengthening the grid in, in Northern Mozambique has some other interesting and, and, and quite, quite enticing um, opportunities that, that, that can be opened up for the energy transition. And the second opportunity that I think we'd like to highlight from a, a domestic gas, um, uh, supply perspective is um, the recent discoveries that have been reported in the last few months in, in, in southern Namibia. Um, and we all know about Kudu, the Kudu gas field that, that has been around for, for, for decades. But that's now potentially being supplemented by, by, by additional, additional discoveries. So we, we did some work in terms of, of modeling what the grid or, and what a gas to power solution would look like that, that, that's based in Southern Namibia or even the Northern Cape. And what's, what's intriguing about that option is, is, is its location next to a grid that that's, is heavily dominated by, by renewables. Um, and and there, are, there, are real grid, there are real challenges beginning to emerge in the grid in the Northern Cape because of the, the high penetration of, of, of renewables and actually adding thermal generation in the next five years um, to that, to that grid can actually unlock um, and, and, and unlock uh, a good deal more renewables in, um, entry into, into, into the power system. Because of, of, the, of just the inherent, the, 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 the additional um, improvements in fault levels and, and, and um, um, inertia that, 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 that thermal, thermal generation would, would bring in that region. So I think the, the, the message or the, the point we wanted to make is, is that we do actually have real opportunities that, 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 that can be executed in the next four or five years um, of gas to power in the region that is going to be a lot less influenced by, by, by global um, uh, uh, vagaries, the global LNG market. And it, and it will be we have a real opportunity to get that gas at, at substantially um, advantage prices versus versus what um, what global energy prices would be, and it'd be a real shame if we, as a region, because we we're looking at this purely from a South African perspective, walk away from those opportunities, and and those um, those gas to power opportunities actually link and and synergize not just from a uh, synergize with with renewables from a grid perspective as much as as from a whole energy system perspective. So what, what sort of costs are we potentially looking at? And, and you know, I think immediately I'm going to say, um, you know, this is, this is shot through with assumptions. Um, all assumptions, the only thing that assumptions have in common is that they probably will be wrong. Um, so it's, you know, I, I urge you not to look at the absolute numbers, but rather the relative numbers. And, and, and what we've just done is said, well, if you assume a certain LNG price and you're assuming that, that you're providing the gas seller in, in Northern Mozambique, a price that would leave them equivalent to what they would have got um, in global LNG markets. And all you're doing is saving them the, the transport cost and, and the need to, 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 to uh, liquefy. You can, you can bring gas to power and generate gas to power in northern Mozambique um, of domestic gas resources at anywhere between 30 or 50 percent less than than what you would if you're having to import that LNG um, and, and trying to generate that power at a coastal location in, in South Africa and particularly if you then want to bring that that gas into the inland of South Africa and then and then, and then generate the, the power that it just becomes significantly more expensive and, and although we, um, the, the costs uh, of, of gas production in the Southern Cape or, or the West Coast of South Africa is, is, is a lot more less certain, you know, it's probably not going to be that far off the numbers that, that, that we 
provide it. So the key question, of course, is one thing to, to have that power up in northern Mozambique, you, you obviously have to be able to wheel it down to South Africa. And I think there's 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 a few points that I'd want to make about about the the the, the, the cost of of the infrastructure and being used to utilize that the, uh, the grid infrastructure in Southern Africa. The first point is even when we added the full cost of, of, of the additional infrastructure invested um, and, and loaded that all onto this one project, you're adding maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 cents a kilowatt hour um, in terms of, of transmission costs. And, and the rest is really about the, the willingness of the, of the uh, power utilities within the region to, to come up with fair and, 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 and and reasonable wheeling tariffs to allow for that power to flow across their networks and, and across the region. And one of the interesting features of the SAP network is outside of the Machaco line, um, most of the interconnectors in Southern Africa are actually underutilized, which is, which is a real shame if you think about the sort of regional energy resources that we could harness through, through regional power. So there's a, a strong argument that actually um, developing power resources elsewhere in the region actually allows us to, to utilize, at times underutilized, um, power, um, power infrastructure. And so the, the discussion should, should, we think, be really about um, what is the true cost of the infrastructure and, and we need to um, come up with, with, with a wheeling and uh, tariff structure um, across the region that is transparent and takes, takes that into account. Of course, <laughs> I've, uh, I've spent, um, really spent the time sort of trying to illustrate and, and, and let me immediately say those are, these are illustrations and, and um, you know, one, one is very cognizant of the uncertainty around many of the assumptions that one's making, but I was, I was really trying to illustrate the advantage of using domestic versus, uh, domestic gas resources versus, versus global resources. But the critical question is, of course, how do the, does the potential cost of domestic gas compare against other, other energy, energy storage solutions? And I think, uh, Dave, you did a great job right in the beginning just to illustrate it and just to mention that there is huge uncertainty. Um, and I'm definitely not going to be standing in front of you or presenting to all of you and, and try to pretend that, that um, with any certainty that a particular technology or a particular option is definitely going to be the best um, best option to pursue as a as a region for for the, the storage requirements that, that we will we will require because the reality as we all know is that there's this huge uncertainty and 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 it would be probably not wise to to uh, uh, pretend that there's more certainty than that there really is but all i wanted to illustrate was that it um uh, for gas resources below eight cents a kilowatt hour brought onto the grid, the chances that you are going to be out of the money is probably relatively low versus where the, the potential um, other um, uh, storage resources could end up. And if you are wrong, then then you're not going to necessarily be that far out of the money. But if the region work, if we as a, as a country and as a region walk away from potentially really um, advantaged um, gas to power, domestic gas to power, and, and, and pin all our hopes on technologies that still have quite a way to, to develop and, and, and quite a way to come down the cost curve. And we're probably going to do ourselves a disservice and make the energy transition a good deal more expensive than it has to be. And the last um, thought I just wanted to leave with you with is that um, in order to exploit the opportunity that domestic gas provides us as, as a region. It's really actually 90% of it is about um, electricity and about the building out the electricity grid within the region and coming up with a regulatory framework that would allow that electricity grid to actually function properly. And that's all about issues of harmonization, transparent wheeling tariffs um, and, and regional energy plan. And, and those, those steps are um, required regardless, whatever the energy solution is that we go for. So these are really no regret moves that I think we, we would love to urge the region and, and regional policymakers to, to embrace as, as quickly as possible. And it may um, give rise to a lot more gas to power, but it, it, um, it definitely 
will give rise to much more inefficient um, uh, renewables and uh, low carbon energy solutions in the region. And with that, I wish to thank you all very much for your time and, uh, and, and uh, thank you very much to Chris for coming back online. And, uh, and I hope your, your internet's a lot more stable now. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. I'm going to switch off my video to try and conserve bandwidth. I must apologize that the introduction, your introduction got broken up and I lost connection here. Uh, situation introduce myself. I could introduce myself. <laughs> situation in Ramsgate is not good with water and telecoms and electricity all coming together to give us these challenges. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fan fascinating uh, series of discussions so far. We've got two more uh, very important discussions ahead. Uh, it's uh, just after, well, it's eight minutes past one at the moment, and I'd like to suggest we get back at 1.15. That's 13.15. We're going to have a little comfort break now, and uh, I know I'm cutting it short, but we are a little bit over time. So can we please uh, be back uh, at um, 13, 15, uh, quarter past one, where we will resume this uh, webinar. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 30, uh, 15 minutes uh, past one, um, 13, 15. So we're back in the webinar. Um, my apologies for cutting your comfort break short. And I just hope and pray my connection is holding out, you know, here in Ramsgate, KwaZulu-Natal, right now. I have no water for a month, no electricity, I'm running off battery, and my fiber connection is down, and I'm running off a Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, a, a wireless hotspot, my cell phone. So it's very challenging. But we press on and we solve problems because we are engineers. So uh, I hope you can hear me. And uh, we now proceed with the second uh, part of this uh, webinar. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our next two presenters. Uh, and the first is uh, Joanne Yowich, and the second is Kesh Mudali. Uh, so, um, Joanne is the CEO of the National Business Initiative and was previously Deputy Director General for Climate Change in the Department of Environmental Affairs. She worked for the Gauteng Department of Environment from 1997 to 2004 and prior to that was Special Advisor to the then Minister of Land Affairs. So a big welcome uh, to you, uh, uh, Joanne, but may I quickly now introduce Kesh. Kesh is the principal uh, and lead member of uh, Boston Consulting Group's energy practice, uh, the hydrogen node for BCG Africa. Uh, he started as a mechanical engineer at various power stations and industrial plants in South Africa. And today, Kesh is also BCG's lead on the Climate Pathways and Just Transition Project, a national study conducted in partnership with uh, the National Business Initiative and with BUSA to understand what it will take for South Africa to get to net zero. Kesh has a BSc degree in mechanical engineering and an MSc in industrial engineering from Wits University and an MBA from INSEAD in France. So a big welcome to both of you, uh, Joanne and Kesh. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Joanne is going to say a few introductory words to uh, contextualize um, this uh, National Business Initiative uh, study uh, that was actually then conducted uh, by Kesh and to put it in its broader context. So we're really looking forward to firstly the introductory words by Joanne and then the meat of the presentation by Kesh. So over to you, Joanne. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chris, and uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, and as Chris said, I I'm going to just give a brief introduction to the study. I think importantly, because there has been quite a lot of debate um, and media coverage of the work that we have done in relation to gas since our gas report was published. But it is important to understand where this work around gas for, fits into the broader work that we've been doing over the last couple of years now. And so nearly two years ago, we agreed um, together with BUSA and with BCG to do a piece of work that would look at how the South African economy could reach net zero by 2050. It was looking at feasible pathways. And we have looked at the economy sector by sector. 
And where we started with, started with obviously was the power sector because the power sector um, in relation to both the issues around decarbonization as well as um, to the broader issues of net zero is central in, in, in our country. Um, the work has been led by a, a group of 30 CEOs from key sectors uh, across the economy, including all of the big emitters. And, um, and it has also been done with extensive industry, industry input and industry support from industry associations, experts from individual companies, um, as well as participation from civil society and from government. Importantly, um, when we looked at what it would take to get to, for the South African economy to move from where we are to a net zero future by 2050, our, our prime and main conclusion, and I think important for the discussion that Kesh, Kesh will take you into on the role of gas, is, is that we here identified, like many others, the fact that what you've got to do is you've got to build renewables on a massive scale. Uh, we're looking at three to four, probably looking at in, installing three to four gigawatts of renewables across the country every year between now and, uh, and 2050. And we also came to the conclusion that in the short run, you need to overbuild renewables, um, partly because it opens the way for things like a hydrogen economy to emerge, but it also has quite significantly important effects in terms of um, labor absorption, job creation, and a set of socioeconomic uh, benefits. And so the transition path that we came, that we developed for the electricity and the power sector really is overbuild renewables, invest in the grid, importantly, so that the grid can, um, both transmission and distribution grids can in fact sustain and, and, and support that degree of renewables build. Uh, at the same time, obviously invest in storage technologies, particularly as they become more affordable and then also build a green hydrogen economy. That is kind of the essence of what we were proposing. What we also came to the conclusion of is that when we look at the nature of our power system, when we look at the nature of the grid, there are significant challenges in the medium term around peaking, around intermittency, around the ways that you balance the grid. And our conclusion was, was that in order to support that in the medium term, um, and until all of these new technologies uh, are mature and are commercialized, that in fact, you are going to need to use some kind of fossil fuel support for the grid in order to achieve that. And in our view, there were two options that really exist. Um, and the one is to use diesel. I mean, you all know that our power system to a large extent is being run on a diesel backup at this point in time. Um, and then the other option is gas. Um, it is, and I think our view on the diesel um, is that it is both expensive and um, polluting. And we were looking at a way that you could achieve that support and backup to the grid, but do it in a way that runs the least risk of stranded assets by 2050. And that ensures that while we get what we need, we, we do it in um, the, cheapest, the cheapest way possible. And as I said, in a way that reduces the risk of stranded assets. And so we came up with a kind of gas light proposal as our solution to that. And um, Kesh will take you into the detail of that. So, so I hope that gives some context to the work that we have done, and I, I think importantly, the fact that this net zero 2050, um, net, net zero 2050 framing is really the basis of the proposal on gas, and you need to locate what we're saying in that context. So I, I think, thanks, Chris, I don't think I need to say any more. Um, I hope, Kish, that I haven't left out anything critical, but if I have, you will, I'm sure you will say it, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Joanne. And thanks for that intro. I think just building on what Joanne is saying, the role of gas report that we published earlier this year is, a, is part of a series of reports here um, that looks at how South Africa can transition to net zero. So I think I would urge everyone on the call, if you're reading the role of gas report, also go and read 
um, sort of the, the report around how to decarbonize the, the power sector and also uh, how to decarbonize the petrochemical sector because they're all linked here. Yeah? Uh, so just wanted to also make that point uh, given, given the background to the study. Um, but, but with that in mind, I thought before we go into some of the details around what the study concludes, it's important to, to sort of think about what, what is one of our fundamental conclusions out of the study in the sort of very specific role of gas that we see um, in the transition to net zero. And I'll voice over it now and we'll cover it as we go through the details of the presentation. Uh, but effectively what we're saying is that we need gas in limited volumes, yeah, with flexible and short payback LNG infrastructure to avoid lock-in, yeah. And this is to balance and enable a larger and faster scale up of renewables, particularly in the long term, uh, with a plan to replace gas with batteries for uh, intraday and short term uh, peaking, uh, but also then with green hydrogen for seasonal balancing, right? So more long duration storage from 2030 onwards, or as soon as we reach reasonable cost parity against these green alternatives. Yeah? So that's a, in broad strokes, a very high level summary of, of how we see um, the role of gas playing out in the economy. Um, as I take you through the content today, I'll cover it in, in two pieces. One is sort of a view of the current context and where we, where we are today in terms of the use of gas. And then we'll cover a future outlook, first looking at sort of where we think demand is going to go. And then secondly, looking at what potential supply options look like in order to meet that demand. Yeah. So starting off with where we are today, so South Africa consumes about 180 petajoules of gas. So we'll use petajoules as a sort of unit of measure for this particular presentation. Uh, most of that goes into our synfuel sector, uh, into gas to liquids and gas to chemicals plants. So you can see the 110 petajoules that's on the slide. And then there's a long tail of uh, other industrial users that make up the remaining 70 petajoules or so. There is also a significant economic value attached to the use of gas today. Um, so in, if you look at the companies that leverage gas uh, for their operations today, um, that's about 46 to 56,000 jobs. It's about 150 to 200 billion in taxable revenues, which if you translate it to GDP is about one to 2%. Yeah? Now we're not saying that if you take away gas, you lose all of these jobs, but it's important to kind of know that this is the current socioeconomic context linked to the consumption of gas and various users in the gas value chain have a different impact in terms of their affordability and the impact of gas prices on their bottom line. Yeah? Now, if we look at where we get this gas from, so all of our gas today comes from uh, Mozambique, uh, from a reserve called Pande Temane. Uh, it comes down from this green line that you see on the screen, the Romco pipeline. Um, and most of it goes into Kaotang and Pumalanga, about 160 petajoules or so. Um, and then what happens is you get some methane rich gas that's produced in the Secunda petrochemicals facility, which is then also sent down what we call the Lily pipeline, which is down here in purple. Yeah? And that constitutes the full 180 petajoules of gas that we use today. Uh, we used to also have gas coming through in at scale from what we call block nine off the coast in the Western Cape that used to feed the uh, Petro SA um, refinery in Mosul Bay. Uh, but that's at, at the moment on care and maintenance due to that uh, reserve becoming obsolete. Yeah? It's important to note as well the current context in the sense that the gas we get from Pandetemane is structurally cost advantage, right? It's not LNG, it's piped gas from Pandetemane. Um, so it's much cheaper than what we see in terms of LNG. And this supply reserve is at risk. Yeah? So the, the reserves from Pandetemane will start declining once you get to about 2025, 2026. There's a bit of uncertainty on the exact date there, but we need to acknowledge that that, that current context that those reserves will decline. Uh, as we as we move forward towards net zero as well. Now, if we look at sort of where do we see the future of gas demand going, yeah, and potentially what could be some of those drivers uh, as we transition to net zero. So we see a very specific role for gas in the power sector, and I'll expand on this in a few more slides uh, coming up shortly. But two roles: one is in the shorter term, so from now till 2030, uh, for intraday peaking, yeah, um, to manage intermittency or variability from renewables. Uh, and then post 2030, once we actually in our system start building more battery storage to complement the use of battery storage so that we can manage system cost at the end of the day. Yeah? And then in the longer term, once we get to sort of 60, 70% penetrations of renewable energy, particularly once you get to about a 2035 uh, uh, timeline, and also in 2035, you see significant uh, decommissioning of coal-fired power stations, you need to uh, figure out how to do seasonal balancing. And there we think uh, gas also will play a role. Yeah? So that's the two regimes of gas uh, use within power. Then we've got the synfuel sector. 
Uh, the synfuel sector currently today does consume the, the largest amount of gas, as I mentioned, about 110 petajoules. The idea is as we move towards net zero, uh, most of the feedstock going into the synfuel sector today, about 90% or so, is coal. Yeah? And so gas can play a role as a substitutory, substitutory um, feedstock for that coal uh, and increasing gas volumes to basically back out more emissions intensive coal. The, the other option of not bringing in gas is to effectively turn down some of the synfuels operations. If you do that, we also have to keep in mind then the balance of payments uh, impact because the synfuels operation in South Africa today does account for 50 to 20% of our fuel consumption. And we know that liquid fuels demand will still be around in 2030. Uh, and at the same time contributes about one to 2% of GDP. So that's the, the key trade-off that we need to assess in the synfuel sector. Yeah? Uh, as some of the other colleagues on the poll mentioned earlier, there is also current gas demand in the industrial sector. So about 50 petajoules or, or so today. And then um, following some consultation uh, with some of the gas working groups, we realized that there's about late, about 68 petajoules of latent demand. So this is a demand that's not realized today because we have uh, limited supply coming into the country as we, as we know today. And then of course, there's a role potentially for gas in transport. Um, we think this will be fairly marginal, yeah, because effectively the trade-off here is between making a, a capex investment, a high capex investment now, and switching to fuel cell electric vehicles for heavy commercial freight, or taking a, uh, a knock on opex and maybe not spending the capex as, as early, and maybe moving to CNG. Being very specific here, we're talking only about heavy-duty vehicle, commercial vehicles. There is really no role for gas in mid-commercial vehicles or light commercial vehicles. We don't need it there because battery electric vehicles today are already at parity. So we see a slight use um, um, uh, role for gas potentially in the transport sector. When we look at gas demand and when we look at gas supply, it's also important to think about all four of these sectors when looking at the supply landscape and infrastructure. Uh, inherently, the supply infrastructure for all of these sectors are the same. And so looking at just one of these boxes is not necessarily telling a complete story. So it's important that we keep in mind all of the demand boxes and all of the implications of that demand when we look at assessing potential supply side options and assuming what the role of gas in South Africa is gonna be. That's another important point before we go into further details. Now, as, as Joanne mentioned, you know, the boundary condition of our study is to get to net zero. One of the biggest emission sources in the country at the moment is of course our power grid. So we did some modeling uh, when we released our power sector report to try and understand how do we get down to net zero. So what you see on screen here is a view of what the power mix in 2050 could look like. Uh, today, we emit about 230 million tons of emissions, which is here on the Y axis of this chart. And then you can see system cost on the bottom axis of this chart. So if you just look at 2050, um, you can get to a least cost pathway. So this is South Africa really trying to get to the least cost uh, electricity price in South Africa. Um, by 2050 uh, and, and reduced to about 70 million tons of emissions in the system. You still have Medupi and Kusile in the system at that point, and you have significant amounts of mid-merit gas. We do see that, the, that compared to alternatives, overbuilding renewable energy and battery storage is by far the best way forward. Yeah? It's got the least marginal cost of abatement. You can see here, if you were trying to decarbonize with replacing sort of Medupi Kusile with baseload gas, um, you get much higher sort of uh, cost, cost um, implications. And then the last mile, sort of the system balancing issue, um, then gets you from 15 million tons down to zero and there's a larger marginal cost of abatement in that. So that's important to keep in mind because I know earlier on in this discussion, we talked about the role of overbuilding renewable energy and battery storage. We have definitely accounted for that. Uh, beyond this point, point three, for every additional battery you build on the system, you get almost zero marginal utilization because batteries is not solving for the intermittency or variability requirements you need for renewable energy. It's a very important concept to keep in mind going forward as well. So what does a, a pathway to net zero look like for the, for the grid, uh, for the power sector? Uh, here you see a couple of different pathways, all net zero compliant, yeah? We've, met, we've modeled one, which we call the least emissions pathway where we have coal off by 2042. You can see that in the maroon lines here and then one that's conformed to the IRP up until 2030 and then optimizes for net zero thereafter. In both of these pathways, we see the role of gas here in this light blue line. And in both of these pathways in dark blue, you can see a significant amount of renewable energy. So to put a number to that, we need about 150 gigawatts of wind and solar in both pathways to get to net zero by 2050. As Joanne mentioned, that's about four gigawatts a year of installed capacity. We've built five in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So we couldn't build renewables fast enough. If we had to overlay that with the hydrogen economy, 
We need another 130 gigawatts by 2030 if we were to believe 6 million tons of demand by 2050. So that's another four gigawatts or so. So eight gigawatts to 10 gigawatts of installed capacity every year for the next 10 years. That's the challenge on the renewable energy front. At the same time, what you see on the screen right now assumes about a 55% load factor uh, on ESCOM's power station uh, energy availability factor. So the point here is if you look at this least emissions pathway that, that really limits the amount of gas we use, I think by 2030, we're somewhere about eight petajoules of gas in the system. Uh, if we don't build renewables fast enough, or if we see that uh, the, the state of ESCOM's power stations deteriorates further, i.e. the utilization factors de decline, then we will mean, need more peaking capacity or um, power support, right? And that is basically the role that gas or diesel could play. So it's important to also recognize that in terms of the role that it, it plays in the power system. So if we go and translate that into gas demand, what does that actually mean? So we do two scenarios here, one with sort of a high demand case and one with a low demand case. Uh, the way to read the slide is that yellow is the sin fuel sector demand, blue is the power sector demand, and purple is the industrial sector demand. Uh, transport is also in here, it's just very, very small, so you can't really see it uh, as, a, as a sliver on these graphs. Um, the low demand scenario basically conforms to the pathway I explained earlier, right, where you have coal off by 2042. The high demand scenario for the light blue line here corresponds to the IRP aligned pathway for power sector. So we see gas demand landing somewhere between 230 to 550 petajoules of demand, depending on what scenario you believe. But these are what we believe to be the bookends of what we could potentially see in terms of gas demand coming from the various different uh, sectors. Yeah. It's important to note also the cumulative emissions of gas itself in both of these scenarios. So in the least emissions pathway, it's about 0.2 of a gigaton. And in the high emissions pathway, it's about 0.7 of a gigaton. Uh, but actually the cumulative emissions impact is the one to keep in mind here because gas also plays a role as backing out some of the coal feedstock in other sectors as well. So that's another balance that needs to be brought in uh, when you're looking at this gas demand. Yeah. So, so that's sort of our outlook for, for demand. Now, if we look at supply, um, we try to map on this page all of the different sources of supply that we have access to. At the time of writing the study, the Namibian discovery wasn't really mapped on this, so that, that's not on this chart. Uh, some of the onshore reserves as well are not, not on this chart. Um, but the way we try to kind of look at all of the different sources here is to say um, each of them have a short-term, medium-term, and long-term time frame. Yeah? Short-term for us is sort of 2020 till 2024. Uh, Mid-term is sort of 2025 to 2030, and then long-term is 2030 and beyond. Uh, and then we try to assess what is the complexity of it getting gas out of each of these reserves. So low complexity in green, medium complexity in yellow, and then high complexity in red. Yeah. So um, for example, you can see that FSRUs and LNG is by far the least complexity and the thing that will be relevant in the short to midterm, and in our view, also in the long term. And some of the uh, upstream gas plays like Ropada, Leipert, uh, Ravuma, we believe uh, the, the complexity to be relatively high in terms of getting that molecule to the de different demand nodes we see in the country. Yeah. Um, so we try to look at this in terms of what are the strategic options for the country. We're not saying we should pursue, uh, initially we said we should look at this quite objectively and not pursue any one of these with any ideolog ideology, but try to weigh the pros and cons of each of these, right? So we did one pathway where there's no additional gas. So we assume the reserves from Pandit Jamani decline and uh, we don't get additional gas. One in which a world in which Ravuma and Brilpada both get developed. There's a pipeline from Ravuma supplying gas into South Africa, as well as Brilpada and Leipat supplying gas into South Africa. There's a world in which just Ravuma gets developed and we build a pipeline down from Mozambique uh, up to, into South Africa. There's another scenario where you just develop Brilpada and then there's the LNG pathway, right? Where we say there is no upstream development, right? It's purely an LNG play. Um, and um, in the end state, even if we get to 2040 or so, we're still leveraging flexible LNG infrastructure to serve that, uh, that gas demand, right? In all of these pathways, we consider sort of flexible storage regasification units, floating storage and regasification units at KZN, Western Cape, Eastern Cape as options, right? In the midterm, because that's the quickest way to get in gas. And then the longer term tending more towards what the actual pathway is saying as an end state, either Ravuma, Brilpada, uh, or none in the case of, of, um, of the LNG pathway. So 
when we try to assess this, we try to make it as sort of objective as possible and, 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 and quant based as possible. So we looked at the socioeconomic impact. So we quantify that in terms of trade impact, but also the broader socioeconomic impact in terms of the industries that currently use gas that won't necessarily have cost advantage gas in the future. Uh, we looked at the cost optimal gas price, and that covers the cost of midstream assets, uh, the complexity of landing that gas, which drives up cost. And then of, of course, the impact on SA's bargaining power uh, when you look at where you're getting that gas from. And then lastly, we're looking at the risk of carbon lock-in. So investing in upstream developments or midstream infrastructure that actually locks us in and therefore means that uh, we are anchored onto that gas supply infrastructure and need to, need, to, need to utilize it, right? So when we looked across all of those dimensions, I'm not gonna go through each of these numbers in detail, but what we find is that LNG, yes, could have probably the worst trade impact, but the least in terms of, uh, or one of the lowest in terms of quantum of, 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 of cost. Um, we think that the ability to get in LNG early uh, will allow for um, 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 demand to also um, not drop, right? So from a socioeconomic perspective, uh, but most importantly, we think that with flexible, the flexibility that you get through LNG infrastructure through FSRUs in particular, you avoid the risk of, of carbon lock-in, right? And so I know we're almost out of time, so I wanna quickly just go into the final trade-off that we assessed, which is going back to sort of the demand side and saying, if we had to look at power, uh, what would be the trade-off between gas and diesel, yeah? And very simply for us, we try to structure it around four key dimensions. One is, what is the operational cost saving of gas versus diesel when we look at power? How much CO2 emissions are avoided? What is the cost of converting any existing um, gas turbines which are running on diesel today to gas? Uh, and then what is the cost of stranded assets or stranded infrastructure in 2035, assuming that we have a green solution that can substitute for gas, right? So with those boundary conditions, we see that the increased OPEX from gas uh, is between 14 and 28 billion Rand. That's at a gas price of around $9 per gigajoule and a diesel price of around 200 to 300 rand per gigajoule. Um, how much CO2 emissions I avoid is about 10 million tons by 2035, less than diesel. Uh, we would need to put in 3 billion more to, to make sure we can convert some of this infrastructure. And then the cost of unamortized infrastructure by 2035 is about 7 billion rand. So in total, about 10 billion in additional cost, right? Uh, but about 14 to 28 billion in additional savings which is the core hypothesis that we have around gas being cheaper and, and less environmentally impactful uh, than diesel. Yeah. So with that, uh, we have a few uh, suggestions on what, what can happen from a policy point of view. I don't think we have time to go into that now. It's all part of our report as well. Uh, maybe with that, I'll hand back to you, Chris, and happy to take some questions later as well. Yeah, my name's Adam Rock. Uh, I work at Meridian Economics. I'm originally a mechanical engineer. I uh, worked for about 15 years in the finance industry, and I'm I've been at uh, Meridian for about 10 years now. So uh, we'd like to present some, um, some further perspectives here, particularly on the role of uh, um, gas in the, in the power sector. Okay, so why focus on gas in, in, in the power sector? Um, for uh, all the good reasons that the previous presenters have uh, ad addressed already, but particularly from a policy perspective, the gas master plan <clears throat> released in December uh, relies heavily on the power sector to provide anchor demand to stimulate or uh, facilitate uh, gas um, in the other sectors. And also sees the, the power sector as uh, the most economically attractive uh, sector from the point of view of uh, developing a, a gas industry. Of course, that presupposes that gas is an economic choice for power generation. So we thought that if we're looking at the, the, the power sector, the, the right place to start would be to uh, objectively uh, analyze the needs of, of the power sector in the framework of providing uh, lowest cost electricity uh, and providing that within the <clears throat> constrained emissions framework that that we find ourselves in the in the current day so uh, if if we look at that it it really at brass tax level boils down to these two questions um, will the power sector benefit from large-scale gas fire generation so 
uh, CCGT machines running at higher capacity factors of 50, 55%, or is the need just for, for peaking plant with, with much lower volumes? So these would be open cycle turbines, capacity factors around 5%. Is it, is it both of these? Is it none of these? Um, so we, we have uh, a, a lot of uh, gas decisions in the power sector being made in the, in the period to 2030, and we've, we've focused on, on this period here, and we've, we've only considered LNG. Uh, LNG, they're, they're also, they're, you know, this is a, a live topic right now, the number of RFIs out in the market, and LNG uh, additionally has a, a visible price that, that we can work with. Whoops. Okay, so the spoiler alert here is that we found that the uh, the potential um, use for for gas in the power sector is a fraction of of the use that appears to be envisaged in in the gas master plan. So uh, it's almost as though we are looking at two different worlds in terms of the the economics of uh, generation alternatives and the emission space that we have. So we went back to the gas master plan and, and read it a bit more carefully. And it, it appears uh, actually that we are looking at uh, two different worlds. So the, the gas master plan it takes its vision for the power sector <clears throat> from the national development plan. You'll recall the, the, this is a document that was uh, came out of the National Planning Commission process. Uh, the National Planning Commission was constituted in May 2010, did most of its work in 2011. And the NDP was published in August 2012. So if we look at the, the world in 2012 that the, the commissioners were looking at when they drafted this document, we uh, back constructed a, um, a history there of uh, what uh, uh, LNG, uh, large scale LNG power would price at in cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, in, in 2012, we had just had the um, uh, award of the second round uh, of REAP projects. And quite rightly, the, the NDP saw a tension between <clears throat> The, 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 what they saw as a quest for low carbon generation um, options and the, the high cost of renewables at the time. So they, they, they saw that those two were, were in tension against each other and that, that need had to be balanced. They also um, identified gas as a viable alternative to coal with uh, given that that gas produces half the emissions that coal do on a per, kilo, per kilowatt hour basis. This was a, a, a reasonable um, conclusion to come to at the time. But what's changed since 2012? Last, the last 10 years have seen probably the, the, the biggest change in the power sector in, in 100 years. In, in this time, uh, it, in this period, uh, re renewable uh, uh, power became economically competitive. So no longer do we have uh, a, 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 a tension between the, the need to reduce emissions and, and costs. Uh, the, these things are, are now pulling in the same direction. And in fact, even if uh, we had no imperative to reduce emissions at all, the just by inspection one can see that uh, if you wanted to build a lowest cost power system, you would be using as much renewables as you possibly could, subject to whatever uh, you would additionally need to ensure security of supply. So clearly, the the the, the authors of the of the NDP uh, did not have this information in front of them. Uh, but this information is, is available to us now. So in 2012, 12, gas was a viable alternative to coal until uh, a, a more viable alternative uh, emerged in, in the form of economically priced renewables. So we can see that 
in terms of LNG pricing, even if we could um, source the LNG molecule for free, this is based on a, on a Henry Hub uh, uh, pricing uh, no, notion. If, if we could source the molecule for free, it, it, uh, CCGT power would come in at about 90 cents per kilowatt hour against bid window five pricing in the region of 50, 50 cents kilowatt hour. Okay, but that, that's not all that's changed since 2012. <clears throat> the gray band here uh, is what was known as the, the benchmark trajectory range. And the, this is uh, what we more colloquially know as the peak plateau decline, the decline emissions range. And this, this came out of the NPC's work and it was what they saw as the uh, the, the allowable emission band trajectory for the country going forward. There was, it was um, quite vague on what happened after 2030, but as you can see, uh, there was a clear expectation that we would be reducing emissions, but we would still be able to emit in 2050. Of course, a lot has changed since then. We have the, uh, the NDC process, uh, where uh, countries need to commit to an upper and lower bound every five years. And that pink area on this chart is the result of our, our, our commitments under that process uh, as, as of last year. We also um, uh, now uh, live in a, a net zero world where, where we know that we will need to not only uh, reduce emissions into the future, but end them at, at some point in time. The, the main thing is that we now know we have a finite carbon space uh, between now and 2050 or, or, or someday close to that. And that total carbon space is about half what uh, was available at the time that the, the, the NDP was, was authored. So taking these, uh, the, the economics and the emissions uh, carbon space reality into account. It's uh, unsurprising that uh, all the modeling of uh, optimal uh, power systems uh, builds as much renewables uh, as possible and emits <clears throat> as little uh, 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 carbon as, as possible. So what we wanted to, to do here is, is try and demonstrate what is, the, <clears throat> what, what is the cost going to be if we ignore the, these um, developments that have happened in the last uh, 10 years. So uh, what we did is we look at the, <clears throat> the three gigawatts of gas-fired capacity contemplated in the IRP that uh, needs to be um, commissioned within the, the, the period between now and 2030. So the IRP envisages three gigawatts of, of gas-fired capacity, but it's silent on uh, exactly what type of capacity this would be. Uh, however, if we, if we look at the uh, the, 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 the current policy and what appears to be the intention is the, in, the intention would be for that to be large scale, uh, a large scale gas deployment in other words, CCGT. So these two, <clears throat> these two um, charts represent the, the cost stack for uh, those three gigawatts implemented in a large scale gas usage uh, um, uh, mode. So operating at 55% and using a lot of gas. Alternatively, in a peaking role, uh, so OCGT running at 5% with the balance of the, of the energy provided by a renewables portfolio. Both of these options would produce uh, the exact same amount of energy over the course of the, of the year, 14 and a half terawatt hours, and would provide very similar value to the, to the power system. So, Critics of this uh, analysis um, might uh, say that we, uh, you know, the variability in the renewables <clears throat> uh, with the 5% OCGT support can't produce the same uh, output profile as the, the CCGT uh, option. 
However, the what we must realize is that we are not uh, proposing these two solutions as uh, options for a, a desert island greenfields uh, power system in which the, the solution would need to match uh, the uh, customer profile entirely on its own. These uh, are um, generation assets that will come into an existing portfolio of assets. In other words, the, the, the entire rest of all the, all the generation um, on the grid. And 14 and a half terawatt hours is about 6% of our, our current uh, uh, demand. So 94% of the power comes from this uh, portfolio of other assets, mainly coal. So a lot of the variability in the wind and solar can be absorbed <clears throat> by the existing assets on the system and does not need to entirely be balanced by the, uh, by the uh, OCGT um, that we've costed in there. So what we see is that uh, the, the use of the um, gas-fired power in a peaking mode results in a saving of close to 6 billion rand per year compared to uh, if, if we use a, a large-scale uh, gas uh, option. However, we shouldn't really see that as a saving on the, uh, the CCGT option because uh, the, the cheaper option is, is actually the rational economic choice. So that 6 billion is actually uh, is, is about 40%, a 40% premium or penalty on the rational choice of, uh, uh, of generation uh, assets. It, it, additionally, the, the, the use of high, uh, high capacity factor gas would emit close to seven times the emissions uh, per year as uh, just using it in a, in a peaking function. So what, what we try to do here, I won't dwell on this too much, but we try to see, well, how, how sensitive is this to changes in renewable costs and changes in the, in the uh, price of, of gas assumption? So anything red in here, uh, it means that the use of, of large-scale gas is not economic relative to a, a peaking and renewable solution. And what we see here is that <clears throat> even if the um, uh, re cost of renewables uh, uh, goes up in, in the short term as a result of the uh, supply chain disruptions, et cetera, that uh, th that we know are likely to influence prices to some extent. Even if, if the next round comes out at 60 or 65 cents, which would be a 20 or 30% increase on the 50 we've seen in round five. If that happened and gas went to the lowest price that has ever been immediately and stayed there, there would still be no uh, commercial case for uh, large-scale gas use. Okay, so what's clear from this is that in the, the current environment of costs and our, our uh, emission space is that large-scale gas will not come into the power system and, and uh, replace coal. The, the, the solution to replace the coal is a combination of renewables and, and peaking assets. And large scale gas will actually come in and displace renewables if we, if we force it in. The, the potential role for gas is, is uh, a, a peaking function. And this uh, is borne out by an, a number of recent studies, including work we did with um, uh, the CSIR and a, a number of, of others. So, uh, the, this role is about one tenth of the role of a uh, large scale uh, a gas usage role. So, <clears throat> uh, 
in order to try and understand what is the what is the potential uh, quantity of gas that that could be reasonably used in the power sector we look at the the various studies by 2030 we need to have about eight gigawatts of peaking capacity uh, online so that's the existing three gigawatts of uh, diesel fired power plus five gigawatts of new capacity in the in the studies uh, uh, modeling the power sector, the, the capacity factor for this, um, for this eight gigawatts is optimally uh, less than 3%. And the, 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 those are power systems that would uh, uh, produce a, a secure and a adequate supply, in other words, with no load shedding. But given the fact that the, 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 the peaking supply is, uh, is basically the last resort before load shedding and, and has to pick up the slack from any uh, unpredictable event. It's it's probably more realistic that uh, the the capacity factor is closer to five percent. So if we're considering uh, that uh, this capacity will, will work on a three to five percent um, capacity factor basis, the the total potential for gas use is twenty five to forty petajoules by twenty thirty. So although that's that, that's an annual usage. It's 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 worth understanding some of the detail uh, around that. And given that it's peaking and unpredictable use, it can vary substantially from year to year. We just look at the 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 last four years uh, with the current three gigawatts of capacity. We have used between ten petajoules in the last year and forty petajoules in the highest year. And we need to understand <clears throat> how this <clears throat> how this might impact the ability to uh, provide this fuel um, from L from LNG. So clearly, it's the the opportunity here is for for gas to replace diesel in a, in a peaking function, and the absolute uh, maximum what that could be is is about 40 petajoules per annum and if we if we look at the difference between replacing that entire uh, volume uh, with gas as opposed to diesel there's a potential by 2030 for a saving of three to five billion uh, per annum and uh, a, an emission saving of just shy of a megaton however when we add a, a reasonable assumption for fugitive emissions into uh, uh, for the gas into that it seems that the the emissions uh, saving uh, probably evaporates. So we identified here a number of of risks to realizing this saving. Uh, in other words, uh, risks to being able to fully replace diesel with uh, with with LNG. And the, these really um, uh, relate to what, what is a bit of an open question around the suitability of LNG, or the LNG uh, supply chain to provide gas for a peaking function. So the, the, the LNG value chain and the supply chain is, is set up to, to work for high volume, steady, predictable offtake. There are a number of fixed costs in the system, like the FSRU the infrastructure, for, for example, where in order to get that to economic levels, of course, the, 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 you need reasonably high volumes. So it, it, we have a, a system that works uh, in a high volume regular base where you have uh, vessels arriving perhaps every two months and by the time the next vessel arrives, all the customers have taken their offtake. The vessel's uh, empty enough that the uh, the next uh, ship there's space to receive the next shipment, etc. But if we if we contrast that to to the peaking function um, in in the power sector, for starters, your your peaking generation assets are your most expensive assets on the system. So it actually. You, you want to run those as seldom as possible. 
then it, you be, because of the of the nature of the peaking it, it's very difficult to pre predict when and how much of that gas you're going to use so you could have for instance a two month period where you use those assets very little you get to the to the time when the next vessel is arriving and uh, uh, likely there'll be a take or pay commitment uh, there will basically be a, a perverse incentive created to burn gas and generate power from your peaking assets that you don't need to do alternatively uh, there might be a two-month period where something unpredictable happens a, a unit blows up at Nadupi. Uh, it could be um, so some other unpredictable uh, um, loss of capacity in the um, in a cold fleet as we're seeing now or with um, more renewables on the system could be a, um, a, a particularly uh, low renewable generation week and you may need to run those peaking assets uh, at their full capacity for four days and burn through uh, the um, your two month supply long before uh, the, the end of that two month period. So then if you if you were to need those peaking assets before the, the next shipment arrives, it would effectively uh, result in load shedding. So the, this is in fact very similar to the uh, what we're experiencing at the moment where um, we frequently have load shedding because we either run out of diesel at some of the existing OCGTs or the diesel that we do have is, is being rationed. Of course, this is a lot easier to fix in a, in a, uh, if, you, if you're burning diesel because uh, diesel storage is cheap and easy to build and you can just build a massive storage at the, at the OCGC, OCGT sites. Of course, there's some uh, other other issues around uh, grid capacity, and uh, that that would need to be taken into account to to understand uh, where uh, possible sites are that um, the, that that new power generation could be sited and and how much um, capacity could be located in in one location. So just to to sum up here, I won't go through the, the next steps and, and key questions. Those are really what we see as being some, uh, some research required to address the, the risk questions from the previous slide. But the, the key findings uh, from our perspective are that gas is no longer a transition fuel in the power sector. It's no longer a rational replacement for, for coal on a path to renewables but it could possibly replace some diesel on a path to hydrogen or, or some other emission-free peaking technology that, that hasn't emerged yet. The, the, we don't see sufficient uh, demand in the power sector to anchor demand in other sectors. And forcing in large-scale gas into the power sector will simply displace renewables, increase emissions, and increase the cost of electricity. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. And uh, you're right. It seems like we are living in two different worlds, two different set of worldviews with a diff completely different outcome. And um, I think you've made some very challenging observations that need to be looked at very, very carefully as we move forward. Uh, you've pointed to this uh, work done uh, by the National Planning Commission that is extremely outdated and upon which some of these differences in the data and in the results and the outcomes uh, seems to be premised. So um, I think that's been extremely valuable and I'm going to now call on Dave uh, Collins again uh, Dave, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I hope my voice is getting through. Uh, but can you uh, take over now and sum up and give us your insights and thoughts as we move forward? Can you see that, Chris? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So um, you've given me eight or nine minutes, which I will certainly stick to. 
I've just made a few points as we've gone along. Um, can you put it into full? Yeah, that's. Uh, can you put it into full screen mode, Dave? Uh, into I could, but I might want to actually work on it as I speak, Chris. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Last minute changes to your thinking. Um, what Anna Marie Anna Maria said. Look, it's a hell of a risky market. Price volatility. Um, lots of risks. I'm starting my video. Let me just do that. Okay. Lots of volatility, lots of risks, geopolitical, demand, supply, economic. So the picture she's painting is that I, I interpret that as a very dodgy picture um, globally for the risks with gas. Um, Henry, interesting thoughts about moving electrons and not gas because of the well-developed infrastructure in the east of the um, subcontinent. The concept that solar in Moz could give South Africa an extra hour of solar a day is a, certainly a very interesting one. And I guess Henry making the point that local supplies are going to be a lot less risky, less global vagaries than uh, when, I, when we say local and when he says domestic, I think he means he means sub-Saharan Africa or he means um, uh, Mars, etc. There's an interesting question just came from Mohammed. Why are we letting so much attention and investment go into gas expansion when we know it doesn't fit our climate commitments and will leave us with stranded assets? That came up during Henry's talk. I thought it was just worth recording. I think that Mohammed's comment summarizes a, a query a lot of people have. Joanne said, look, we're going to need fossil fuel for the grid for a while, whether it's diesel or gas, fossil fuel is here. And the solution is to go to gaslight. Kesh, then, forgive me, Kesh, I have um, done a bit of um, screen grabbing uh, because I thought this was a this particular um, this particular point that you made here is really sums it all up. That your view that gas is needed in limited volumes with a very flexible, e.g., FSRUs, to allow faster scale up of renewables but really with a plan to replace gas with batteries and green hydrogen. And those remember everyone, those are the two uncertainties that we still have. Um, somebody else mentioned about, we should be doing cost studies on BES, on battery storage, et cetera. Um, I'm not aware that we really have really up-to-date studies with agreed assumptions on comparing gas costs with, with, with batteries. And of course, green hydrogen is a bit away yet, but we maybe need to do more work in this particular field. Um, sorry, Kesh, apologize again. I know you're going to share these slides, but I did um, plagiarize some of them. We talked about the electricity fact, uh, sector. We do need something, as Joanne said, we need a fossil fuel. You're saying gas. Uh, Sin fuels needs to substitute for coal stock. And the big one, I think maybe we can start it, uh, not ignoring, but not. Um, paying too much attention to going forward is transport, because there seems to be an increasing global agreement that, um, as Kesh said, light commercial vehicles and cars are going to go batteries and not going to go hydrogen with fuel cells. Um, Paul Vermeulen made the point that uh, in the chat that uh, the best use of gas um, would be to place the generation on the grids of the metros with their distribution constraints. Just interesting thought. Um, I am not clear. Uh, Kesh talked about the five pathways um, and the, the pluses and the minuses. So, I mean, that's something I guess Kesh and, and, and Henry could, could discuss to really share ideas and, 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 and get that really more quantified, more a more probabilistic viewpoint on that. Um, Kesh again, the four questions. Now, Kesh, this is an interesting one that BCG are saying that, look, there's 14 to 8, 28 billion rand of savings if we go gas versus diesel. And remember, we said at the beginning that this is a question we want, we need to address. How do we balance renewables? Is it going to be gas or diesel? 
cash saying 14 to 28 billion savings and about a 10 billion capex, which makes the case for gas. Um, Adam, then finishing off with Abbott, um, Adam, um, noting that the gas, I think the big point that Meridian's making is that the gas is a, a fraction, they think, of what Gump is talking about. And we really should only be talking about just peaking at 5% capacity. And again, Adam made the very good point that a lot of the thinking was anchored in 2012 when gas was a viable alternative to coal, but something else has come along now, renewables and batteries. And we now have this situation where the lowest emissions are now the lowest cost, which I guess that happened, I don't know, I'm sure there's lots of different viewpoints that probably happened three or four years ago. Um, yes, very much the pressures on South Africa to reduce emissions have, have actually got worse um, in the sense that we now are on this, we have to go to this red wedge rather than the gray one. So we've got to be very careful about how we use our space. Um, Adam Meridian making the point in their view that um, it's going to be, rather than putting in the three gigawatts of gas, it's going to be better, uh, of large scale gas, it's going to be better to use renewables. And that still seems to be an issue that is um, has got a, a divergence of viewpoints. And then, then Adam summarizing that, yes, gas for peaking, but not to replace coal. And if we go to larger scale gas, it's going to cost us more and it's going to displace renewables. And there are key findings. Um, I think this is what Meridian said in July 20. Um, they said basically chill for the next 10 years. Uh, and now they're saying, yep, a cautious incremental approach. Um, and there's the point about gas versus diesel. I think we still need a bit more discussion on that, um, that based on a lot of the assumptions, um, because these numbers do look a little different from what BCG have, but the principles may be similar, but really we need to be clear um, there is some role for gas to replace diesel, but we need to work on that a bit more. I'm nearly finished, Chris. Um, so I had said right at the beginning that there is disagreement between the expert sources on gas versus diesel. I think that still may be the case, but it is probably a much closer position now. And I want to record something that Andre Botta said in the chat. Uh, I mentioned this a moment ago, it would be good to have a view of the cost comparisons, capex, opex, nuclear, hydro, and the various best options. I think, Andre, the nuclear and hydro have been done, but I take your point, possibly we need to look more at the battery, the, the best options, um, particularly in the light of the latest information. Um, and with that, Chris, I will hand back to you. Well, thank you, Dave, uh, for doing the honors there. And I just pray and hope that you can hear me without me breaking up too much or even losing connection. You sound uh, good, ladies, Chris. Ah, oh, that's good <laughs> for a change. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have asked our presenters to participate in answering the questions on the Q&A as they arise. And I do see that there is a lot of engagement on the Q&A with responses to some of the questions and that has made my task much easier, especially in the light of my weak connection and the fact that we are running out of time and we've eaten into our Q&A time considerably. So uh, I thank the presenters very much for uh, you know helping me uh, answer some of the questions, many of which I wouldn't have been able to handle myself, but you've handled them in the text format. Uh, but we have got a little bit of time and I would like to make a suggestion that instead of trying to wade through all these text questions, many of which have actually been answered, would anybody like to put up their hands and ask a question verbally? So I see we have got uh, something like 400 and something attendees at the moment. And I see a hand that is up already who I would really like to hear what he has to say. 
uh, and that is uh, Anton Eberhardt. So Anton, I'm allowing you to talk now. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question or make your point uh, to our presenters and let's see if we can get this discussion going. Hi, Chris. Uh, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Thanks, uh, Anton. Yeah, thanks, thanks for this um, webinar and, and thanks to all the uh, presenters. So, so when I, I think about the, the sort of gas sector going forward, I think very much in terms of what are the next investment decisions that are going to be made or, or what are the, the kind of regulatory or policy decisions that need to be made to shape that? You know, sure, 2030 or 2050 is important, but what's critical are those next, next decisions. So, so my first question uh, to the presenters is existing gas users, natural gas users, which is uh, Petro SA, uh, the gas has dwindled, uh, the plant is idle. What are they going to be doing to replace that? So, so what's happening around Brulpada and Leipzig, uh, the total energy uh, resources there, which are not very far from the FA platform to connect? Is there a business case to be supplying that gas combined also with maybe substituting some of the diesel at Kurika and maybe another gas to power plant, the first question. And then of course, Sassel, and, and uh, we had some indications of what's gonna be happening there. The Tamani um, uh, Pande supplies running out 2024, I think 2025. That's a huge issue. Um, they get gas for around two um, dollars per per gigajoule or million BT, BTU. Uh, LPG uh, uh, LNG landed there is going to be much much higher. What are the consequences and what plans are being made? So that, that's the first question. What what's being done to replace existing resources? And then second question. It seems to me that the whole petroleum landscape is, is changing massively. And so as oil majors lose resources in, in Russia, uh, they will be more likely developing resources in Africa, including these new total energy resources off uh, north of the Orange River in Namibia. And that resource field extends down to South Africa. So what are the implications there, not just for oil, but associated gas uh, for our, our um, for the future of gas in South Africa. So sorry for being a bit long, but interested in responses to that. Yeah, thank you very much, Anton. Uh, and I, I guess this is uh, a lot to do with the regional issues on gas, uh, both South Africa and regionally. Uh, so uh, Henry, if you are there, and I see you are there, uh, perhaps you'd like to give some uh, insights here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. I, I think maybe if, if I start with it, the Petro is a question. I mean, obviously, I, I'm 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 not a fay with <laughs> the commercial discussions that are that are ongoing. But but you know, I think a a, a an existing GTL facility that where the capital has been sunk, um, and you have a, a gas field close by. You know, I guess the economics should work. Um, but but I get you know, there's there's probably a lot in in, in the detail. And and if if you could bring that gas onshore, supported by by an existing GTL facility, um, to then run Ho Riqua, you know, which is very close by, and displace that diesel, um, it's it's definitely, or I won't say definitely, but likely to be a cheap option in importing LNG to displace that diesel. So, so we we definitely think um, Leipzig and Brokpada to 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 feed Moss gas and and Ho Riqua is, is is on the cards and. And if there is enough gas, um, and and there's there's definitely some running room in that gas resource, to then to then add um, uh, further gas to power at, at substantially cheaper prices than imported energy. And I do have to stress that I think I think we are we are fooling ourselves by by doing analysis purely based on imported energy. You know, the, the, the gas the gas picture, and and we are unnecessarily constraining ourselves potentially. In terms of the pace of, of the transition and the, and the risks we're having to take. In terms of, of the questions around Sassel, um, again, you know, one, one's not sure what, 
what what discussions are ongoing but but um, the reality is that um, there's been a lot of exploration activity in southern Mozambique and and not not much has been added up until now to, to the existing resources so one would probably have to look at, at imported LNG and again I would stress that that the solution is probably regional and not and not national in that in that Maputo is an import harbor for LNG is probably better suited uh, to supply the in existing industrial demand in, in South Africa than, than Richards Bay or, or Kuha. So, you know, again, when we're thinking about imported LNG, let's also look at, at, at regional resources. And then I think, Anton, you, you're quite right. Um, there's, there's been some significant discoveries um, in southern Namibia with associated gas. Um, there's, there's no reason why there isn't further gas south of, south of the Orange River or you know, in the, on the South African side. And, and I, you know, again, I'd, I'd highlight the, the real um, integration opportunities of, of having a, a thermal resource generation close to the, um, to the uh, uh, renewables dominated Northern Cape. And, and there's an, uh, another interesting synergy with, with, with green hydrogen in that um, the, the potential to supply that, supply Gauteng, uh, from those gas resources, from the gas fields of, of the Northern Cape are potentially a lot cheaper, definitely than bringing it on less complex than bringing a pipeline down from the Um and, and there's some interesting potential um, uh, synergies to, to transport green hydrogen within and co-mingle that green hydrogen with, with gas to, to Hutting, which is, a, which is something else we can, we can consider. So I hope, I hope that answers those. those uh, thanks very much, uh, Henry. For that, and I think something you've said just touched me, and I see there are some other hands up, uh, but I'm going to sneak in a question uh, my, my, myself. It gets to the very heart of things. You've talked about thermal gas power stations, and you say there's a need for it. By that, you're implying power plant running in mid merit or base supply mode. You know, at a load factor of between 50% and 75%. And then you have the studies by Meridian, which are saying that that's absolutely uneconomical. And I just want to mention something that a gas development manager at one of South Africa's leading gas companies mentioned to me. When I say leading, he knows a lot about what's going on at Brilpada and Lake Perth. Maybe you can get a hint on, on what company I'm talking about. But he said to me that unless there is significant uh, gas to power demand for gas, which means base load and mid-merit plant running continuously or in mid-merit mode, unless there's that kind of demand for gas in, from South Africa, from South Africa and nowhere else, just from South Africa, unless there is that kind of demand, it's uneconomical to develop, to explore, develop, uh, uh, operationalize, uh, transport uh, 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 gas uh, to South Africa. So unless we're talking mid-merit and baseload uh, gas, as far as he's concerned, those developments there, Brutpara and Leipara, will not happen. There is no business case. And that ties in with what um, Adam is saying. Um, so I'd like to call on Adam and ask Adam, is, do you really think, is there a business case for running mid-merit and base supply gas to power in South Africa, which will make Brutpara and Leipara viable because according to the people that are doing that development, unless there is such demand, it's not, there is no business case. Your comments, please. Yes, I, I guess quite simple response, Chris. If you, if you look at any, any of the studies in the power sector, not one of those studies suggests that we need uh, high utilization of gas, uh, gas power generation, uh, in, in order to have a, an adequate uh, power sector. The, in, in all the studies, the, um, whether it's gas or diesel or whatever is providing the function, we, we need a low capacity factor uh, peaking support uh, for, uh, you know, to, to cover the renewables. And that, 
that is the case until uh, whilst there's a significant amount of coal on the system, uh, you, the, that still holds. The only time that uh, we've seen that changing in the modeling that we've done is uh, in scenarios where we take all the coal off. So this is sort of towards the late 2030s. And uh, in the absence of any, uh, any other generation uh, option at that point, then there's a requirement for uh, a, a relatively small amount of, of CCGT type capacity running at, at those higher capacity factors. But that's at least 15 years away. We, we don't need to be building that now and running it now. And uh, as, we've, as we've seen, if, if we look at what we didn't see coming in the last 10 years, uh, if anything, the pace of technology changes accelerated, uh, there, there will be th uh, technologies emerge in the next 10 years that uh, we haven't even contemplated uh, at this point. You're mute, uh, Chris. Sorry, uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, and I see Kesh would like to come in with some responses, I think also to Anton's question. Kesh, over to you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks, thanks for the questions as well. Um, so just wanted to respond to a few points that, uh, that Anton queried about as well. So, so I think maybe just to add some numbers, right, to the, the trade-off between baseload gas and mid-merit gas, because we did model that in our systems analysis for the power sector. And so when you, so, so let's, let's, let's kind of break the problem up first. So firstly, what is the max amount of renewables you can build in the grid before you start having marginal costs, i.e., the cost of renewables now is, 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 is incrementally more because you're not maxing utilization on that renewables, right? So let's, let's, let's assume that's our starting point. Now, at that point, you have 70 million tons of emissions still stuck in the power system. To get from 70 million tons down to about 16 million tons, you can overbuild renewable energy and battery storage together, right? At a marginal cost of around 230 rand per ton. So how you can interpret that is if you had about a carbon tax of around 230 rand per ton, you could get the system down to about 16 million tons of emissions. If you were, going to go, were to go base load gas, so if you had to replace that uh, current sort of uh, uh, power generation that's being generated through Madupi Kusile um, with, with base load gas, the marginal cost comes in at about 2,000 rand per ton, right? So, so that's just to give you a bit of a quantum of, of the system economics, not just looking at this on an levelized cost of electricity basis for gas versus uh, renewables versus battery storage. You need to look at the systems view. Uh, and when you look at the systems view, baseload gas is, is terribly expensive. Yeah? Um, so, so just wanted to share that, uh, that perspective and, 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 and those numbers. And um, I think maybe just also on the, on the um, GTL side, when you look at sort of the Petro SA situation, right? So I think um, Henry made the point around the economics need to make sense. Um, I think globally, there's about four, four or so gas to liquids plants, right, that operate because, and these plants sit on top of cost advantage to gas, right? So in South Africa, we had that prior before. Um, we have it today as well from Panditamane, which is why we also got a gas to liquids plant up in Mpumalanga. Um, but you do need cost advantage gas for this, for this to work. So, so just wanted to stress the importance of cheap gas. Uh, for any economics uh, to make sense at, uh, at, 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 at the Mosul gas refinery, and therefore the dependence on Brilpada Lepat also being developed um, you know, um, in, in, in a way that, that results in cheap gas. And, and cheap gas today, I mean, for example, Panditamane, sort of four to five dollars per gigajoule. Um, and then you know, you'd need to believe something similar can come out from Brilpada Lepat in order for the, for the economics to make sense. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think you've sort of confirmed my, my thinking and even the thinking of the man from Total. And, and it just worries me that what you're saying is that a base load and mid merit gas to power is not an option. First of all, if we want to meet our carbon uh, climate emissions, uh, climate commitments. Uh, second, uh, second of all, you've, you've just said that, that, that it's not an option, uh, you know, to run unless we've got cheap gas. Well, let's just assume that the gas from these two fields is cheap, as you put it, low cost. Let's use the word low cost. It still requires mid merit and base load operation to justify the business case, according to the person from Total that, that told me this. So I, I'm just 
still uncertain in my mind as to the, the very business case, even assuming there is low-cost gas from Broadpuda and Fado that has been developed, it will still require a massive offtake to make it viable, an offtake that, according to Adam, we don't need. Ladies and gents, I wish we could go on longer, and I see there are further, three further hands up, and I'm not going to uh, ignore your hands, uh, Craig, uh, Katlejo, and David. Uh, but I am going to call an end to the official proceedings today. There are some people that need to uh, uh, rush off. Uh, but we're going to continue this discussion after this closure. So I'd like to bring this to a close. I'm sorry about my own connection. Uh, it's distracted me and disturbed uh, the, the, the discussions. But I still hope that it has been uh, meaningful to you, the audience. Um, I would like to then announce that we will be Doing further webinars, both in the gas field, in the renewable energy field, the agrovoltaic field, and the electric vehicles, uh, electric vehicles field, uh, all of which are critical to the future of South Africa, its decarbonisation efforts, and the just transition. And um, so I'm going to draw close to that and to tell you to watch the space as we announce uh, further webinars um, in these different areas. Um, so with that, uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. But we're going to carry on. For those that can stay on, that would like to stay on, I'd like to ask David uh, if he is still there, and I see his hand is still up, uh, but David, uh, can you make your point? I hope I've, uh, I've allowed you to speak, and uh, please switch on your mic. Thanks. Yes. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I've got two short questions. The first is the, the uh, research that Tobias Bishop names that at, at the CSIR was based on uh, 60 cents per kilowatt hour for wind and solar and two rands per kilowatt hour for, uh, you know, open cycle gas turbine power. Uh, and then, uh, and that brought him to one rand per kilowatt hour for the, for the mixture. Now, um, my, I believe that since then, the, the price of LNG, uh, that would have been the driven with imported LNG. LNG price, I believe, has shot up by about a factor six. Now, um, the people in the, uh, in, in the uh, nuclear and, and, and coal lobbies at the moment say, well, that, that proves that Tobias Bishop's NIMS, uh, research is now off the table. We now need coal and, and nuclear to, to proceed. How would that numbers have changed? What is now the, the, the cost of the mixture in the light of the higher LNG price? And my second question is, if you forget about utility scaling and just look at your own house, regardless of all these sums, you can now just put solar and batteries in your own house and you can uh, provide your own power well below municipal costs. So is that not the thing that, that's going to take over? And then, then you can supply two thirds of your own power on a cloudy day you, you still need, uh, you know, from, from the grid. That's my questions. Uh, thank you, David. I, I'm not sure who to throw this at, but let's start off with Adam. Um, I, and, and also just to say, David, uh, yeah, gas, uh, you know, LNG prices shot through the roof, but battery storage is coming down. Uh, <laughs> and, and so um, uh, maybe there is still a role for gas as peaking plant, as Adam is suggesting. Uh, but certainly not um, uh, to run at higher load factors like uh, 50%. Uh, but maybe to run at load factor, I'd be interested to knowing from Adam, is there a business case for gas running at a 15% load factor, uh, you know, to complement uh, variable renewable energy? Um, or is there only a role as peaking plant running at a maximum of 5% load factor. And also maybe you can answer other David's other questions uh, while you're about it. Over to you. Uh, I think, Chris, your, your question's a bit easier to answer. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think the point is we, we're guided by the, the capacity factors that we see in the, in the system modeling studies. And, uh, you know, those, those studies take as inputs uh, the cost of the different um, power generation alternatives and the a, a, a demand profile increasing over time, et cetera, and they integrate all of that. And uh, based on that, uh, they produce a power, a power system and a, a simulation of how that power system needs to be run to provide, uh, you know, to adequately meet demand in every hour and et cetera. And, and in those studies, we don't see capacity factors of 
you know, it, well, for starters, we don't see any uh, CCGT uh, being built other than, than in the, the, the situation I described earlier when the, yeah. the coal all comes off. And we don't see the capacity factors of the, uh, of the ICTs, um, you know, anything above, uh, you know, three, five percent in the optimized scenarios where, where, where it hasn't been put in as a, a minimum or something. So uh, I think that that speaks for itself. If if, if it was um, if it was viable to do that, then the, the it would be reflected in the results of the modeling. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I look, I, I think we're going to move on in the interest of time uh, to a question uh, by Katlejo Sema. Uh, Katlejo, I see your hand is up. I'm allowing you to talk now. Uh, can you switch on your microphone and uh, ask your question? All right. Uh, can you confirm if you hear me? 100%. We can hear you. Thanks. All right. So my question, basically, I ask myself, having listened to all the presentations, is that... Um, why are we still constraining uh, ourselves to uh, the grid? Um, I understand it exists already and it's a capital cost that the country has paid. But why, if we are looking at the future from 2050 and onwards, why would we constrain the possibilities beyond 2050 and still constrain them to the grid? The problem with the grid is that we can see that criminals hold the country at ransom uh, by sabotage and uh, so and also uh, prosecutorial capacity is dwindling so we cannot basically discourage uh, criminality so all technologies concentrating to the grid will become uh, at risk of being useless compared to the opposite where perhaps gas being abundant as as it's being shown here why not concentrate on developing technologies that bring this concentrated source of energy more and more to domestic users? Uh, distribution technologies and facilities are already there, like gas cylinders that are safe and reliable. Question is now, shouldn't we be developing technologies to create conversions that allow use to supplement renewable energies? Uh, uh, sponsor technologies that are portable enough, safe enough to convert such concentrated liquid uh, natural gas into useful energy that is needed by, by appliance users. So, so that's my question. Thank you very much. I guess it's all about the price, uh, but yep. you've talked about grid issues, and I'm going to throw this at Henry because he's... Uh, uh, spoken about our grid being reasonably reliable, um, and uh, uh, Katlejo has presented another view that it's becoming less and less reliable. I must also say that you're going to need a transmission grid and a distribution grid for, for gas that will probably be equally vulnerable, maybe even more vulnerable, because it's not got a live voltage that you and you can't actually touch it without getting electrocuted. So I, I, I'm not sure that whether the argument holds, but over to you, Henry. My view is not important. Uh, your view is... <laughs> Yes, Sorry, sir. I, I actually meant that you have distribution technology in a form of uh, cylinders. Gas cylinders yeah. are okay. cold and they work well. Yeah, maybe yeah. fine for domestic, but maybe not so fine for Cecil. But okay, over to you, uh, Henry. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I guess I'd agree with you, Professor. Well, I mean, to move to move gas molecules is expensive, right? So so um, and and I appreciate. I mean, there are challenges with the with the grid, but. Um, you know, we need to we need to look at moving electrons, uh, not 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 gas molecules as much as possible. Although obviously there's there's existing industrial use, um, um, and um, you know, and then it's about moving moving it along along pipelines. So, you know, the 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 there are applications of of moving uh, CNG um, around, and 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 I wouldn't discount that, but it's not. It's not. It's not the solution to our problems. Um, we, we need to. We need to focus on strengthening the grid, and 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 that's not. That's not about. It's not about gas to power. It's about any power. And 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 I guess you know our argument is as much about leveraging um, regional power resources, whatever whatever they may be, um, and, and not just uh, not just domestic. 
Thanks, Henry. I see Craig Morkel's hand is up. Uh, Craig, um, I'm allowing you to talk at, as we speak. Um, uh, can you uh, switch on your mic and over to you? Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you for allowing the question. I, I, I want to ask the question to both uh, Henry and Adam in particular around the issue of uh, the comparison being made between LNG imports and uh, either regional gas or indigenous gas or domestic gas in South Africa. Um, I saw in Henry's slide that um, there was a, a, a comparison between gas prices within the price range. And um, I wanted to check with him whether that was based on feedback from the uh, present license holders of upstream gas in South Africa, both offshore and onshore. And then to check whether the numbers he presented there represented more of um, an, an onshore gas uh, or offshore gas uh, data uh, based on uh, such uh, feedback from uh, producers and prospective producers. We, we are aware that there are uh, successful discoveries, uh, some in production of onshore gas. We, we, we know about Drolpada and Leipat, as mentioned earlier, and the potential for gas uh, elsewhere on our west coast and east coast. But I think we need to just clarify whether that input cost um, reflected in Henry's slide uh, takes that into account. The reason for that question is that we need to consider not only the levelized cost of energy or total system cost uh, of each technology, but also the other key decision-making factors that make up the policy decisions around mass planning. And in particular, risk, risk of non-supply um, uh, in, in, across all the technologies uh, in a globalized world supply chains can be disrupted by pandemics and wars, et cetera. The scarcity of raw materials being finite for each and every technology uh, becomes an issue. Uh, beyond risk of the environment uh, or to the environment, uh, but last and most importantly for, for, for South Africa as a developing country uh, are the socioeconomic benefits. And I wanted to check with Adam and Henry uh, whether they have run comparisons that include uh, a weighted scoring type uh, system, uh, a multi-criteria decision matrix that assigns weights to these various uh, affordability risk and socioeconomic benefit uh, considerations uh, from a policy perspective, and not from a scientist, scientific perspective per se, or cost perspective only. But uh, if you were Gwere Mantashi, and you had uh, to uh, take the responsibility of energy planning, not only for its cost, but risk and socioeconomic benefits. How would the picture change perhaps? Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much for that uh, very probing, uh, in, insightful question. And I think it deserves an answer. So let's start off with you, Henry. So, so thanks, Chris. So I think there were two parts to that question. I think the, the first one that the numbers we showed was was purely taking, assuming that the upstream developer is 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 um, is equal in terms of either selling it as LNG or selling it domestically. Um, so all they are saving is all the substantial costs of converting the domestic gas to, to LNG. Um, those costs are, are I, I know because we've. we've We've engaged. Our the actual production costs are actually probably lower. So, so there is there's definitely downside um, to to some of those costs from a from a domestic gas perspective. I think those those socioeconomic um, criteria we ha we haven't you know we haven't um, um, uh, taken account of or considered. So you know that could be a bit additional consideration. Although you know I would I would say I think um, and, and probably Adam and I would agree on this. You know. I, we need to look at the cheapest um, form of, 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 getting, of getting electrons on, on the grid. I think just maybe one point I want to make, Chris, if, if you don't mind me going back to, to earlier discussion. Um, I think we mustn't discount the, the, the potential of gas 
um, and for industrial use in, in the Western Cape, there's a substantial market of LPG, um, which, which can also help to, to, to underpin um, and, and support, um, support uh, uh, you know, a gas development regionally. <clears throat> and so, so you know, we, we definitely are not, I uh, just want to be clear, we're not talking about, about base load gas. Um, we, we're talking about um, um, deciding, you know, sort of uh, mid-merit um, sort of gas with, with, the, with the development actually being supported by a combination of, of mid-merit uh, gas and, and, um, and, and industrial use. And, and it's justified on the basis of substantially lower prices than LNG. I don't think anyone will argue that you that, that LNG imported LNG makes sense on a, on a mid merit or, or, or base load basis. Thanks. Adam, do you want to uh, respond as well on your side? Yes, uh, Chris, thanks. So um, if we look at the uh, that example that um, was in the presentation related to the three three gigawatts of power and 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 the comparison between that that as uh, you know large scale or CCGT uh, type of configuration as opposed to peaking. If you if you looked at if you look at those two options, the 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 peaking in the peaking role you use about fifteen petajoules of gas per annum, and in the um, uh, large, large scale use you use about 107 petajoules. So uh, there's about a 90 petajoule difference per per annum. So if we if we're looking at the socioeconomic benefits from from gas and we're comparing against those two, the so we already demonstrated that. The, the cost difference between those two would be 6 billion per annum. The emissions difference is worth sevenfold, but it's, a, it's about um, uh, just over six megatons uh, per annum. So uh, any socioeconomic benefits arising from that additional 90 petajoules of gas use, for starters, they would need to outweigh the cost benefit the emissions benefit and all the socioeconomic benefits that would accrue with 4.7 gigawatts of, of renewables. So I think it's important to, you need to watch the counterfactual here. The, the socioeconomic benefits uh, in gas and the socioeconomic benefits in, in renewables and, and the other options. And of course, to do this properly, you need to assess both of them and, and um, analyze them against each other. Yeah, thanks, Adam, for that. Uh, I think that's answered um, uh, your question. I hope it's answered your question, Craig, at least to some extent. And I see we have a hand up from... Oh, his hand has gone down again. So let's go to Michelle Rivarola. Michelle, I'm going to allow you to speak now. One second. Okay, if you can switch your mic on. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, one aspect that hasn't been really discussed is that uh, from next year, um, some of our larger trading partners will start charging carbon excise duties on the carbon content of the products that we export. Um, that will create a major risk for the whole of our automotive industry, um, which is mainly geared towards exports to Europe and exports to the United States. Um, so when we look at a low carbon economy, we actually need to look at what our trading partners also would like us to do. Otherwise, we're going to be operating in a vacuum. Um, and the other point I'd like to make when everybody talks about hydrogen as a gas. Um, Chris, I think I've sent you a link to a webinar from the Argonne National Laboratories. In fact, there are a substantial number of companies in Germany that are actually looking at blending uh, hydrogen with biomethane and generating an e-fuel, which is a liquid fuel with zero carbon emissions because it's based on sequestrating carbon and it's easy to transport and can be combusted. It can be used to store energy and so on. So I think you know, technology progresses at a faster rate than we can think uh, about it. And 
you know, when we look at storage, we're always looking at batteries, 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 and batteries. There are lots of other alternatives available. And I think people need to be a little bit more uh, open-minded about what storage consists of rather than having tunnel vision and only looking at batteries. Michelle, thanks for that. I'm going to put this to Dave Collins because you you know more about climate change than I will ever know. So yep. and carbon emissions and things things like that. So Dave, what are your thoughts and comments to what Michelle had to say? Michelle, you made two points. First of all, on transport, absolutely, and um, there'll be quite a few reports coming out in the next couple of months on the transport sector. And one of the points being made very very strongly is that our internal combustion engine exports are just going to disappear for the very reasons you mentioned. Um, on the hydrogen thing, yeah, I mean, hydrogen, no one was talking about three years ago. It probably kicked off in this country, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. And I mentioned it when I was talking that the, um, the steel industry was thinking that they would be able to reduce iron oxide, and iron ore, with hydrogen, maybe 2040 in South Africa, maybe 2050. Uh, and that's come forward 15, 20 years. So you're absolutely right. And I think the hydrogen space, there's gonna be all kinds of interest in development. You mentioned this blend of biomethane and hydrogen. And I'm sure you know that um, it looks like ammonia, which is NH3 is going to be the preferred, is probably gonna be the preferred uh, fuel for shipping. So yes, absolutely watch the space. Hydrogen is a field to get into. There's going to be so much happening. Yeah, thanks, Dave, uh, for that. And one one thing that hasn't been touched on in the whole today that I can remember, of, of, but I did I was cut off for a while, so maybe it was discussed when I wasn't. And that is the question of methane emissions, uh, and and uh, you know gas as a transitionary fuel. Uh, you know, it's talked about halving the carbon emissions. But when you take into account the methane leakage in the extraction, liquefaction, uh, transportation, regasification, and induce, uh, the, the, the leakage can outweigh the benefits uh, to the extent where there's not a lot of difference. I'm not sure if any of that has been taken into account, for example, in Kesha's modeling uh, or, or, or in Adam's modeling, or have we just worked on you know the carbon emissions from the burning of uh, of the gas. Uh, Kish, do you want to make a point on that before we call this to a close? Yeah, happy, happy to come in, Chris. So, so, so we did do an analysis on that. It's in our role of gas report. You can see all the numbers there. Uh, across the value chain, we do estimate, even with some of the risks in terms of efficiency at the different points in the value chain, um, we will still uh, be uh, net net less in terms of CO2 equivalents, right? I mean, to be to be to be clear, once we burn the the, the gas, it's 99% CO2 that comes out the end, right? So the big question mark is how much leakage do you believe in terms of pipelines, right? And so yes, there are data points that show in the U.S., for example, that there is massive methane leakage, but there are also, you know, majority of most pipelines, in fact, have minimum leakage, right? So it depends what you believe in terms of the pipeline and how much it leaks. Given that we are advocating for convertible pipeline infrastructure, so this is infrastructure that can take at least a 20% blend of hydrogen in the future. Um, you know, it's new infrastructure and it should be a boundary condition of building it, right? So we're not going to build something that's leaking. Uh, and if you look at the upstream um, leakages, South Africa's demand for LNG is so small, it's not going to anchor a new exploration investment globally, right? So we're going to use existing LNG infrastructure um, as part of fields that already exist. That's at least the position that we've taken in our study which is why we advocate so strongly for LNG as a flexible use case. Even if there are some upfront costs that you need to take, uh, the risk of, of infrastructure lock-in is much lower with that mechanism, yeah. Uh, and Chris, sorry, yeah, can I just add to what you and Keshav said? Just add to what you and Keshav said. Thank you. Just, just quick. Yeah, I mean, we're engineers. We don't design for leakages. We don't design for waste spillages from nuclear plants. We're engineers. Everything can be engineered. Uh, so I think, uh, my impression of, of the spectrum of reports on leakage from, from methane is there's one or two points, and as Kesh says, the vast majority of plants are not leaking. So it's the usual media hype and people using it to their advantage. Interesting. Thank you for those insights. Um, yeah, look, I, 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 I note also what uh, Kesh has said. You know, I think he's advocating for LNG. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure if I'm right in that. Uh, uh, I'm also not sure that, that uh, you know, we're taking into account the risks, uh, the international, uh, you, you know, supply chain risks that we're seeing at the moment with LNG. <laughs> so I, I'm left in a state of some confusion after this uh, talk. I'm going to study the presentations much more carefully. Uh, you know, uh, tonight and tomorrow and over the weekend, and I hope the audience will be too. For me, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Quite a wide divergence of uh, views uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, the assumptions, uh, what was these facts based on? Is it an old, out-of-date document, or is it up-to-date, or is it using the latest technologies, or what? Uh, so, for me, really interesting. I don't think we've resolved the issues yet, but I think just opening it up, putting it on the table for analysis so that we can study it will enable us to hopefully make uh, more informed uh, decisions and opinions uh, than uh, just simply listening uh, you know, to lobbyists lobbying one direction or another. And I, I think our presenters have done a fine job in presenting hard fact-based information uh, based on studies and work that they've done of a very serious nature. Uh, and this is not about lobbying. This is not about uh, about you know selling something. Uh, this is about you know South Africa Incorporated. What is good for South Africa? What's good for the economy? What's good for the people? What's good for development? What's good good for the transition, the just transition? So I think our presenters have really done us credit, and I'd like to thank them one and all for this, and also thank. Uh, the people that have supported and sponsored this event, it's made it possible. Again, I want to apologize for the um, poor reception and the problems I have down here in Ramsgate with water, electricity, and telecoms. It's, uh, it's very challenging. Um, normally, my fiber optic cable here works perfectly, but today it didn't. Uh, in fact, the fiber optic line is down, and I had to use a, a Wi-Fi hotspot connected to my cell phone connected to the Vodacom network. Um, but somehow we got through this and thank you for your attention. We look forward to seeing you at the next uh, webinar. Uh, we've gone on an extra half an hour. Uh, I hope you found it useful and we look forward to seeing you again. All the best.